time opening. We have an eye, sort of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Oh, there we go. <laughs> That's how, we, how appropriate that we start off with that. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Anatomy of a Movie. I'm John Comerford. I'm joined on the big panel by Sir Stratton. Hello, everybody. Phil Tech. Hello, hello. And helming the booth is Stephen Lemieux. Thank you very much for helping us out, Stephen. Hey, guys. So, uh, saving Mr. Banks, was it? Uh, did you find it chimchimery, or did, was this a medicine too hard to swallow, even with a spoonful of sugar? I mean, I wouldn't say it's the most chippest movie in the world, but I <laughs> did really enjoy it. I thought that they had a good balance of fun and character development, and I was very intrigued by the stories and the characters, and I really liked it and mm-hmm. liked everyone involved. So, I'm... All into this movie. I thought I thought uh, it was I thought it was a perfect movie, you know, in, in the sense of perfect. I, wow. I th- in the in the way they told it, I thought that you know you, you definitely knew that you were watching a movie, but it was beautifully shot, mm-hmm. it was beautifully told, and things like that. And this mm-hmm. is the, I believe this is the first movie that we're going to talk about that's the making of a movie. Yeah. So we're going to be di- dissecting the dissection of a movie, movie which is going to be very interesting. meta. I mean, it's very still meta. screenplay, it's still actors, yeah. it's still. Yeah, all of that. Well, I think it f- certainly delivered on what it promised. It does. It. I mean, you're getting exactly what you think you would get out of it. I mean, it's it's funny. It's you, you certainly get the tears, and uh, you know, and then actually you get even a little bit more because I had no idea it was going to have some sort of that that the depth that it did. I did too. I wasn't. I knew what the story was about, and I grew up with Mary Poppins as uh-huh. the Disney film. Um, and this film obviously gave me kind of a different interpretation of that movie, mm-hmm. and. It added its own different themes about family, yeah. about you know alcoholism, about all these other layers, mm-hmm. um, which I really enjoyed because it it wasn't just the making of, it wasn't just an explanation of why they made it. It really dealt into people's lives, but also gave you a larger picture scope. So I liked it. In that yes, sense. because uh, just the fact that something that is a great childhood memory of mine or and, and of many, Mary Poppins, and you realize that that came out of a hell of a lot of pain for somebody else. <laughs> I thought our childhood memories, which are great, are coming off the pain mm-hmm. of somebody else. How wonderful. And the relationship that this movie has with artists and how they create yeah. and the relationship between characters and their development. And mm-hmm. I believe there was one line that um, one of Tom Hanks' lines was about how not only are they family but it's a release. It's a release yeah. for them to fix the world and these characters they create. And I, I just thought that was beautiful yeah. and a beautiful message. Well, we have lots to talk about. Phil, you've done tons of research. I don't know how many pages of notes you have over there, so oh I'm gosh. anxious to hear what you had to say. Um, well, we, ha- we have a very close friend named Andrew Lee yes. who um, who owns uh, J- uh, Lee Apparel, mm-hmm. and they license out to Disney and things like that. And he's a huge fan of Walt Disney, and I wanted him to be part of the panel. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, he could not. No, no, so I, I had to guy. do him a great service by doing a lot yeah, of so, extra okay, research. Because you know he's going to be listening, and he'll be making sure that you get this stuff right. Okay, so all the Disney trivia, yeah. all of those, are, we're going to pass to Phil. Oh, absolutely. So he he's going to verify everything. <laughs> I'm the historian here today. all the people who know everything right. about Disney, you all can right. judge. So Phil. let's start off by how this thing came, became a movie. We're going to talk specifically about the actual, uh, well, the, the road to it becoming a movie. Rather than getting into the history or the story of it, let's just talk about how it became a movie. Because I think, if I'm correct, uh, it's Ian Colley that started this with a... Uh, uh, basically a documentary of P.L. Travers and her history and all that kind of stuff in Australia. And then from that, he realized there might be a picture involved or a film, a, bio, a biopic or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, he hired or he brought in Sue, if I'm not mistaken, yes. to help write this. And it was brought in outside of Disney, Absolutely. completely written separately. Yeah. And then from there, it's obviously very famously been blacklisted. Mm-hmm. And... And for those Love. who don't know the blacklist, if if you, wanna you want to elaborate on that, sure, elaborate blacklist. on that because a lot of people may not know that. So basically, the blacklist is a a bunch of screenplays yes. that are voted on for being fantastic, mm-hmm. but no one makes them. Yeah, they're, they're supposedly the ten best movies floating around Hollywood that haven't been made. Exactly. And every year they come out with this blacklist, and everyone else is wondering why aren't these being made? Yes, oh my um, God, it's amazing. It's this amazing. one. To me, I completely understand why it was on that list. There's a lot of hurdles involved with this screenplay. One of which... What? What? 
I don't know, Disney, home, <laughs> That's protected brand that yeah. owns the world. Yeah. That could be part yeah. of it. Yeah. Which um, is very uh, oh, close to the vest on what they want to uh, yeah. allow people to use in terms of licensing. Go ahead. And so she was very accurate. I mean, Sue made a point to say that if Disney hadn't picked up picked it up, no one ever for could. Yeah, I, I don't know how just you could get it. Just because of licensing yeah. and the, just the arrangements and all the legal stuff behind this. And that, I found that interesting, too, because they even wrote the script knowing that we're writing into the script the, be, uh, the ability to use some of these songs and we have no idea whether or not we're ever going to get them or have the rights to use them, but that we're going to use them as our motivating factors for our actors. It's and, just one of those things that proves yeah. sometimes if you don't put yeah. all of those restrictions about yeah. what's possible and what's impossible mm -hmm. in the creation of a film or whatever, mm -hmm. then it turns out great because like you have to push through and you have yeah. to find those things, mm -hmm. but you're not putting those limitations on yourself before you create right. it. You let yourself create it. You let yeah. yourself have this world. Write the best thing and you can you and worry about the rest of it later. Well, I think, exactly. you know, for for Kelly, when she got involved, for her, it was all, it was going to be about forgiveness. It wasn't going to necessarily yeah. be about the negotiation part of it. Right. And so when you come into it from that perspective, you do want to write the best screenplay yeah. possible. And, I, you know, that's where it stems from. It's like, okay, well, you know, if we're going to do this, I have to use the music. And that, right. that's what she said. There was, you know, there was yeah. a choice in my mind. I had to. Mm -hmm. Which is very interesting because the, the music had nothing to do with the, the it, well, P.L. Travers because obviously the music mm -hmm. had been written. It had nothing to do with her history or why those those characters became what they became. But I, I just love that they found a way to use them and, and, and uh, help support the story that they wanted to tell. I completely agree. Also, I the music along with some of their to me, their shot choices uh -huh. really brought you back into that world of Mary Poppins and the one I remembered. Right. Um, so every time a song came up, it did remind me that they were making this in this effort to make a joyous film mm -hmm. and a film that really did last with, I think it grossed over a hundred million throughout the years. It's like 102 million. And so mm -hmm. this Mary Poppins impacted a lot of people. And every time one of the songs would come up, I was kind of reminded of that. Also, yeah. when they had like the shots, there was of picking up the carpet bags and of yeah. her feet and that reflection and those parallels they yeah. brought from the original film. I really like. Well, just even, you know, we opened up with a spoonful of sugar mm -hmm. and, you know, in the movie, there's that line, this is going to be a very iconic song. People will be singing it for weeks to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to open up with that because, yeah. you know, I asked the people that I was with and I was like, is that your favorite song? Is that what you sang? Yeah. It yeah. was. Yeah. And, you know, to, to have that foresight then and obviously to bring that into the script. We'll talk about all the golden nuggets. You didn't also like how that was like a, she used that line before they wrote the song? I did. She, yeah, how mm -hmm. she asked for a spoonful of sugar in her tea? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, yes, draw indeed. notice to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else was I going to say? Uh, you know, in terms of the... the uh, this is Emma Thompson said it about it, about how she kind of approached the character, but it does go back to the script, how there's no clear arc... For the character, and in times she tends to be inconsistent. Yeah, with, with the way she is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I like that because again, it is um, it's a little bit different from most. Yeah, movies. I usually have a clear arc and everything there, but you know, I I I, I didn't agree with that so much because I, I for me there did seem to, for me there was a clear arc. I understand that she was inconsistent, but people are inconsistent. They're not always, you know, mm -hmm. it's one of the things that confounds us about being human. Mm -hmm. But what I liked about that is what you liked about it was different. And but I could see because she was on this, the whole thing was confusing and con and confounding to her uh, in sense of uh, she's in this play. And I know we're not going to talk story, but the character itself, because of where she is in her life, she is being battled, batted about a little bit by life of, of where she is. So that's why I thought that inconsistency made sense. Yeah. And even though uh, the the final thing was about forgiveness. She couldn't get to any of that forgiveness until all this stuff had she had gone through all this other stuff. And I think that one of the reasons the inconsistency worked so well mm -hmm. and we were able to like her through it was because they did have the dual narratives going. Yeah. And because they brought back the flashbacks that were giving mm -hmm. you insights as to why she was acting Be that way. Because she's so prickly. <laughs> exactly. That made you, it right. made her more endearing. It made you see her creative side mm -hmm. and that she did have this imagination and this love and this potential. So the inconsistency that Emma Thompson was playing, mm -hmm. I felt I was more inclined to like accept and enjoy it, because I was getting the reason why right. she was like and, that simultaneously. And if I can, I want to point to when we talked about gravity, uh, one of the points I was making about that particular character, the lead in that, uh, she was obviously in pain, but we didn't really know anything about what was going on until way late in the movie. So it was, for mm -hmm. me, it was hard for me to understand her, relate to her. This one, because of this nar dual narrative going on, I understood her, even though I thought she was a horrible person <laughs> to a large degree. You understood that she was in a hell of a lot of pain and why. 
So you, I think you could relate exactly. to her better. Exactly. Exactly. You, know, you know, in terms of this, again, um, just going off of the idea to make this a perfect thing, the actors really felt it was complete by the time it got to them. The story. You know, you're yeah. talking about the script. The I time mean, the Colin, Fer- it. Colin yeah. Farrell said, you know, when it came to them, it was nice to get a complete script, yeah. unlike most things that he's worked yeah. on where they're still rewriting it after yeah. he's shot everything. D- yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're rewriting it after. So, you know, to get that, it was not a breath of fresh air because they could approach the characters right. uh, knowing what was going to happen. Yeah, with a very full script that had gone through, what, well, at least but 10 years. But also you kind of have to. I mean, when you're dealing with real people and a real story in the making of, you kind of have the story already laid out for you. I mean, it was a script and there are layers that the writers put in, but... They're, but you have to make. Here's the thing, you know, uh, what um, the director and everyone else compliments Kelly on um, is that she made the right choices. Right, mm-hmm. story's all about the choices you choose not to include versus right. the choices you yeah. do choose to include, and they felt that she did it very um, wisely yeah. throughout. Mm-hmm. And I would agree because you know because they joked about it. I mean, yeah, you know, how many hours could have gone spent, anywhere? Yeah, how yeah. many hours could be spent just in that room? Right, you know, and how boring <laughs> could that actually be? Yeah. Because it could be quite quite boring, and so she made very specific choices, mm-hmm. and the way, you know, and the beats. Overall, I thought you know, in terms of beats, it wasn't a typical story. Mm-hmm. So you felt it was different than usual. So that obviously impressed you and surprised you. Yeah, yeah, that, and you liked that because I know you hate it when they have the typical stuff, <laughs> which is so weird because it's a Disney movie. You would expect it to have a lot of typical. Well, it had the, it had the typical in terms of messages and mm-hmm. things like that, but then the way it was told, you know, was different. Yeah. Specifically, are you talking about the two narratives, about the character work? Uh, right now, specifically about the narrative. Okay. You know, and I, I thought um, at, at first, you know, uh, when I saw the two different worlds, um, there was a point where I was getting bored of it and I didn't understand. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. this is going on a little bit too long. I, I get it, mm-hmm. but I don't need to be hit over the head. And then when um, when the two worlds collided, literally yeah. at the, uh, the county fair with that song, mm-hmm. it just great filmmaking in general but it literally symbolized you know These collision of her world exactly and so she chose the right moment you know mm-hmm. I, I again I, I give a lot of effort a lot of credit to that because it was the perfect moment to do it mm-hmm. so her past coming in to collide with the future yeah. or her present mm-hmm. but I, I you know a lot of not a lot but a few uh, critics I've, I've read have talked about how they didn't like the structure of this and I, and I, I, I don't I don't I can't understand that. I didn't. I didn't have any problems with the structure of this. I was just like, "Wow, well, it's an easy thing to follow." I don't know why. I don't know why anybody would have issues with it. But did you guys? Uh, were you uh, at all thrown by it, the dual narrative or the way that they? I wasn't thrown by the dual narrative or by like the actions going on. I think mm-hmm. that one thing that did was given to away, away to me beforehand mm-hmm. was that her father was struggling with alcoholism, mm-hmm. and so I knew that going straight into that world okay. um, before he pulled out the bottle, before she, before the mother mm-hmm. found it in his jacket, any of that. I already kind of knew mm-hmm. that. Um, without that, I think I might have been confused oh, okay. for a little bit. Um, but as I said, I thought it really supported mm-hmm. Emma Thompson's character, and I liked that I needed it. It was also interesting to me that it was very visually different. Mm-hmm. Like, color-wise, it had much more of a dreamy effect where mm-hmm. everything does seem childlike and mm-hmm. happy, and it's this fantasy world, but... I thought that that's so connected to Disney, and mm-hmm. to me, the film as a whole worked with the two narratives, with the styling, and although they were different and definitely clashing, it didn't it didn't bother yeah, me. Yeah, I didn't understand that cri- critique at all because I, I I didn't understand how anybody could be confused by it. <laughs> I mean, it may, was the worry that it's for a PG thirteen audience, and uh-huh. so they might not get. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it, I can't. I just I'm glad that you guys. Didn't, I mean. Do you think this was really targeted to people, though, that were under 13? I think that it... I mean, they made very... Just in terms of Tom Hanks alone with... with, I mean, this this ties back to Walt Disney himself, where uh, he thought his public image would go down with his... Mm. You know, if he showed himself actually smoking. Yeah, if he ever... And in order to be a PG-13 movie, they could show him um, finishing Mm -hmm. his cigarette, cigarette, but but never taking it off. And he had to fight for that. Tom Hanks personally had to fight for that. Well, Disney wouldn't sign on. Mm -hmm. They had, like, a couple qualifications. That was one of the qualifications. You can never show him smoking. Not Mm -hmm. inhaling. You couldn't... I'm inhaling. That doesn't mean you couldn't have. The but 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 the point of that is that uh, obviously they wanted to get the PG-13 rating. Yeah. Why why in the world would this Saving Mr. Banks be an R-rated movie? Just right. because it's you know what yeah, I mean. I so yeah. so they want to go for that younger crowd. Well, yeah, but it's a family I, movie. It yeah. came out during the holiday. It, well, yeah, clearly, yeah. But, but I guess I would. I guess I personally don't picture this as like a children's family movie. I do picture this as 
I would say I'm like on the younger end of the audience. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what I've read is that there there've been a lot of parents taking their kids to it, 10, 11 year olds. Yeah, absolutely. Not kidding you. They they all they've all have asked was like is it appropriate? Because they think it's about Mary Poppins in some way, but you know, it's not a Mary Poppins movie and, and I don't think it's made for kids at all. I think it's an adult movie. I do. I, but I, I don't, you know, it's, but I don't, it's obviously I don't think not it, an R movie. Yeah, but so, what prevents it from kids only being because able to, I I think they would get bored with the fact especially the uh, Australia stuff is like, you know, that what what is, you know, there's kind of I'm fun, not, but there there are adult themes and I mean, know, for kids it, it, it's it's one of the the great conundrums of this movie. Do you see you know do you see Mary Poppins before you see this movie? Do you yeah, see it after? Exactly. And especially no, if you've I never do. seen it, right. then you're yeah. like, you that's any the kind big of, choice. Yeah, that's what I mean. If you don't know Mary Poppins, does this movie hold up for you? Because a lot of I mean, let's face it, the music is in the whole thing's about Mary Poppins. Yeah, but the, kind of but even even from the script level, they would you know we'll talk about the golden nuggets that they inserted throughout the whole movie. Yeah. But they were very conscious to to be like okay it needs to be a standalone movie if yes. someone saw this yeah. for the first time it would have to make sense and the, and for people who know mary poppins yeah. it would make a lot more sense and be again it's golden nuggets yeah but you just get a different layer you get an added layer knowing yeah. oh that song's from so-and-so and, so, and yet, yet it's being used for this character's uh, uh motivation and it, it, so it still works as a standalone you don't have to know mary poppins at all yeah. that i agree with but i will say that this isn't for like children, the themes, yeah. the content might not specifically be vulgar or anything no. like that, but the themes to me are for a, an older audience. Well, I'd, I'd say an adult. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I assume you mean older, just older than children. Yes. Not like I'm, I'm, 55. I'm, I'm talking about okay. when you have Frozen Got out it. there right now. And oh, you I have see what like you're saying. Brain okay, fair and enough. All those yeah. that are family movies mm -hmm. that kids bring their. But don't you find it weird that they're taking their kids to this? Because I would go, why would the kid be interested exactly. in this movie? I, I see this being as a kid's movie. Really? Okay. Except, okay. The now, the only part that um, I didn't know when I was going to bring this up, but right, um, right. P.L. Travers, uh, she believed there was three stages oh, of a boy. woman. Oh, my God. No, because it's. It's funny to me breaking this out now no, okay because, go ahead i'm breaking it now because we're talking about how there's nothing bad in it and and you know when, when you think about this quote you start to wonder uh, what about the author about the author what mm -hmm. what um bad stuff really is there um so the three stages of a woman according to to p.l travers is a nymph a mother and a crone there you go and i think we get all <laughs> we uh, except i guess with the exception of the mother yeah which i don't know maybe you guys can make an argument for we get uh you know at least the two mm -hmm. in the in the movie you can pick the nymph ones if you, you want. You get the mother. The yeah, mother, you definitely the, get the mother. There's a mother in the okay, movie, the mother go. of her. <laughs> exactly. Almost committed suicide, that mother. In the river. No, but I'm talking about her. The, her her particular stages. Her, yes. Well, it's, I mean, you can argue that she mothers Mary Poppins, the story that her creation and how she mm -hmm. guards it with her life and everything. You can argue that that's very motherly. Yeah. Because she was trying to protect it. So, so you can argue yeah. that. So. There you go. So we got the three stages of. Yeah. There you go, and you know we don't know the context in which she wrote, she wrote that or said that, but that I think it's an interesting. Uh, it's well, a little for whatever reason, that's the context that is remembered, and, yeah. and Emma Thompson keeps referring to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. all keep referring to it. Uh, well, it is. It's very provocative. Let's put it that way. So. <laughs> Do you want to say anything to that being the only woman on the panel I mean, at the moment? <laughs> it, I mean, to me, it kind of fits. Peel Travers character where it's just very <laughs> blunt and straightforward yeah, yeah, and very much. there's a part of you that likes it because you're like okay you have to kind of take her for what she says mm -hmm. and then the other part of you's like can you be a little bit more polite and give us a gray area <laughs> the gray area yeah. kind of we kind yeah, of need that sometimes so, oh man okay well, uh, one, I can picture her saying it quite clearly okay I want to wrap up with the uh, production part of it in terms of how it got to the movie just with a couple of things uh, I had read that Disney of course uh, obviously came in to be part of it and, and for a while had purchased it and shelved it and put it in turnaround and then brought it back or whatever. But they weren't really involved in the final of this or they were, obviously they had discussions with Johnny Hancock and the uh, writers mm -hmm. and everything like that. But apparently there wasn't a lot of uh, imposition. Did you guys uh, read this a lot? Because normally uh, they, you would think they'd have way more control over what they you were allowing. You have that person just sitting exactly. over the shoulder Exactly, I mean, that's not, it's, it's not just Disney, no. it's Walt Disney you're portraying and all this other stuff. This is the first time Walt Disney's mm -hmm. ever been portrayed on film, so it's like. I think he was portrayed once more in a supporting character in like 1941. Okay, I stand correct, or sit correct. Or something like There's that. There's the fact that, I don't, but you know, um, with Tom Hanks having such a yeah. close tie to the whole thing, mm -hmm. um, to Disney specifically, I don't know, you just knew he was gonna do the right thing by them. Oh, by Disney? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I don't again, I, it's, I don't know when, you know, kind of what came well, first or whatever, but. 
I, I, he came, I believe. What I, do you mean? What came first? In the, in the sense of know. when they gave kind of approval and and kind of stepped back. What you know? I don't know exactly the timeline. Was it once Hank got involved? Or I, yeah, that's well, a good question. Well, this is what I will say. Go although, ahead. like, I did read similar things that yeah. Disney wasn't really, you know, making a checklist of what was yeah, okay they and didn't what do wasn't a bunch of notes, which is weird. I worked for him. Anyway, go ahead. I did thought think it was interesting that they opened up the archives yeah. and gave the actors the full, access full to that access, to yeah. make these characters really full. And I think that's And so did gave, Travers. Yes. And I think that's or what gave um, Tom Hanks and Emma Thompson mm -hmm. these fully lived characters because they really could research and they were that wasn't blocked from them. That was given yeah. to them freely. Like Tom Hanks had access to the museums. He had access mm -hmm. to recordings. He watched like everything disney recorded on his um tv broadcast but here was so, here was here was his problem though it's all disney being disney yeah it was i don't know how much no, of it was behind the scenes he had, he had, he had both but what i'm saying is there's so few moments of disney not being well not hey being welcome on. to oh yeah you know it, it, that you there was very tough for him to get a conversational sense of walt disney um and you know for for those moments specifically he said you know there was there was very few instances and he was able to pull from that but then also he kind of drew just from memory what Walt meant to him mm -hmm. for and those. his relationship with family and like you I think you can get a some idea of who he was from obviously the interviews he had he had his daughter to talk to and the choices Walt makes in how he created his life and how it does gives you insight into who he was as well well fair apparently that didn't quite work for Tom is all I'm gonna uh, say. Fine, fine. He said it multiple times that he had a tough time finding the golden <laughs> nuggets. He, you know, he didn't even know where to begin for it. He literally felt like a coal miner, just digging and digging and digging. Well, it could also be that that we there's so there the the amount of information of Disney the mogul or Disney the uh, guy mm -hmm. on the TV th that's voluminous, but there's yeah. probably not much behind the scenes sure. stuff. So, uh, in in that's why you'd have to be the miner. Yeah. How do I sift through all the stuff that's already out there and that's in it? But how do I get to the real guy? I mean, just, you know, take take this in, in general, right? Um, we'll talk about Sherman specifically being um, kind of a liaison to this movie. Yeah. But he One of the Sherman brothers who was the uh, lyricist and composers that wrote all the songs. Correct. So basically the role that Emma Thompson was playing, he was doing for this movie. You can make a whole nother there movie. There's another one. It's so meta. <laughs> so meta. But he was saying... Uh, what was my point? I'm sorry to interrupt. But I'm just trying to <sighs> give people context. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you. But um, the the point was that you know he didn't understand uh, he didn't understand Travers, and so you know had he known the story, it would right. be much easier for him to accept. And so exactly. you know, sometimes it, if, in ter in terms of Tom, sometimes it is tough to dig through that. Right. You know, despite ha yeah, despite you know, because that's just the tip of the iceberg. But who is the real person? Yeah. Now with Travers, you got you know just this bitchy woman, right? Who apparently believes in three stages of a woman, right, exactly. but there's so much more. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. That's what I loved about the movies because you get her. She's so hard to get, you know come. She's so bristly that you can't really get close oh, to her. Oh, I anyway. loved her. Well, that, that's I, I loved, loved her, her too. Within like a minute. Well, sure, yeah, she's but wonderful. but if you're trying to work with her and all you're getting is that, it's real hard to be collaborative with that. I mean. True. Okay. I, I didn't so, want to work with her. I just want to watch. But that's work exactly. With I loved watching her. I thought it was wonderful that she was just so unlikable to some degree, and it's so hard to work with. But if you, but as you get to know her and understand her, then you can start to see, and that's what made the movie because it's just really unpeeling mm -hmm. the layers. And you know, by the end of it, she's still prickly. She's still that bristly and all that other stuff. But because you understand her, I you kind of I think you enjoy her. You and you, she's mm -hmm. more endearing. And I thought, I I thought the the the, um, the writers and the composers themselves, the, while they never understood why, at yeah. least they understood the quirks, right? So Sarah's wearing <laughs> yeah. red, so like, okay, no red. No they red. just understood the rules yeah. under which she lived by, and it was like, okay, here's our checklist of yeah. what not to do. So let's try and navigate the minefield so we can yeah. get out of this thing alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not a musical. No. Well, what? Well, uh, or the animation part when Wonderful. what's his name spills the beans. No, oh, no, no, they're animated. Just yeah. storms out. Yeah. No, yeah. all of those things. Yeah. Those are great mm -hmm. moments, especially the introduction. And that was, I believe, drawn from her real first life interaction. When she went into the interview, she was like, this is not going to be a musical. First thing she yeah. said. Mm -hmm. And you just got all the guys who've been working on it so hard and their faces just dropped. So I like that they pulled that crazy moment from right. a real life experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, there's been a little bit of controversy about that. A lot of people, not a lot, I keep saying that, but there have been a few people, people talking about there. talking about saying that th this is just a way for Disney to, you know, you know, re-market uh, uh, Mary Poppins, that this whole movie is, who cares, you know, because it's just them trying to get the Mary Poppins hot again. And I went, what? 
Any um, first thoughts off, on that? Okay, first off, uh, so what? Yeah. Because so, it doesn't, that doesn't mean the movie's not good. Yeah, and the second off, if, if, if the movie wasn't good, then it wouldn't make people want to see it. Right? And this Correct. movie, honestly, is good. Mm -hmm. And people... People are liking it. People want to see it. And so I I don't buy it. Honestly, what I think is more than anything, I think it's done a service to the books rather than just the movie. Because I, I know a lot of people that love Mary Poppins never even knew it came from a book. Yeah, I didn't know it came from a book. There you go. Case in point. And now and do you now, want to read it? I'm kind of scared to read it because I'm like, okay, how did people like this book? If this is the woman, this is the woman who wrote it. Yeah, and, and she but aren't has you intrigued? such a she has such a not cheery disposition. Yeah, but aren't life. you intrigued by the book? It's like wow, how how different are the books? Don't you want to know that? I I do, it, but I'm scared. Yeah, I'm scared. He yeah. doesn't want to burst his bubble. Yeah. yeah, I would agree, but I think that you have a very good point. The whole thing about it sparking interest is whether or not it's good. Yeah. like the things that you see, like the cash cows, or when they make mm. like. Lion King 9. Mm -hmm. And then they're like... Which, by the way, was a lovely... <laughs> All this stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's when you're, you think, okay, they're pushing the envelopes. Yeah. This is a new creative perspective I exactly. about a dissection, I, and it's done well and well, really well, lived. So I, I'm and not going to find for my, anything. Much like there's passion for making um, Mary Poppins, right? right. And, and everyone endured for that. Yeah. Here... Obvi everyone just has a clear passion for wanting to make this movie, yeah. right? We talked about Kelly, the writer, mm -hmm. um, the director, and Emma, Kelly, Tom, Colin, everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, they all love this script. Yeah, they wanted to be a part of it. Emma joked about it, like, "Hey, I'll do this for free." And they're just like, "Well, just kidding. We're not, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not doing but it for I, free." I, the argument is, I just when I hear that, I go, "Are you kidding?" So you're gonna tell me that the person Ian Colley, who first came across this story and thought it might be a good movie, and then he brought in Sue Smith, uh, they went. Let's see how we can help Disney exactly. promote Mary Poppins. And they weren't part of Disney when they wrote it. Exactly. <laughs> they didn't even know if they could get the Disney songs. Are you? I mean, where I are you coming up with this idea? I mean, on, on the one hand, you do have Disney who went in and was like, oh, wait, this could be a oh, good sure, idea. Oh, sure. Of course. But they're a business, and that, it's a good product. Yeah. So I'm... Yeah, I just think it's <laughs> just kind of funny. But, and who cares? Don't make things that'll make you money. Because, uh, uh, here's the ironic part, to though. Jail. Here's yeah. the ironic part, though. Had Disney not done that, yeah. what do you think people were like, oh, wait, where can I get... Mary Poppins. I want to see Mary Poppins again. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. It's just going to be a natural reaction yeah. and, if the movie and, holds and up. Not only that, but if Mary Poppins was a crappy movie, no one would care. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. but obviously it's brought a lot you of joy to, to a lot of people, so who cares? But I yeah. just find that when people are, and I'm going, what, what is their point for you making an argument? You can't attack someone who's uh, a business for trying, for making for trying money. Make money. Sense. <laughs> well, How dare you? At the end of the day, we can't attack the people that are making these claims because they want a business and they want to sell paper. Yeah, that's true. Mm. So, yeah. we're Fine. only attacking well, I don't, people. Endless that, circle. No, they weren't in business to, uh, in a paper uh, because they're not making any money. There <laughs> you go. Be, I don't know. Well, online, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, let's get more into the screenplay because we uh, talked obviously somewhat about it. What mm -hmm. did you just think now in terms not how it became a screenplay, but just what did you feel about the screenplay? Because like scene wise, going yeah, just scene, scene, scene and to scene, and, and just uh, you know, go I, ahead. obviously I know Phil Phil Phil's Phil's he, Phil Phil's Phil Phil Phil's. He I I he thought, thought was, they they, they uh, in terms of the images, you know, what I mean, obviously anytime you write a script, you know it's going to be translated to visual elements, right? And some of the best screenplays are ones that, uh, ironically, are more visual rather than dialogue. And I yeah. thought that the images that they chose and the way they were able to use them throughout the movie, mm -hmm. uh, Mickey Mouse in particular, oh. yeah, uh, it's just mind blowing. Well, see, that, that's what I was talking about—the the, the clear path you have in terms of her arc. You see her the first time she comes across Mickey the the doll. She wants him she's confronted with him on the bed she's freaked out by it a little bit get the thing out puts she him puts him in the corner out. gives it a timeout, and what well, i can't remember the line she says but it's very dismissive you can stay here exactly <laughs> and pretty much at the midpoint of the movie she's uh you know she's been thinking about her past and she's you know she's in some emotional turmoil and she brings him into bed and basically oh, uses right. him for solace mm -hmm. to try to you know get, get kind of Keep in mm -hmm. touch with herself and touch whatever. And by the end of it, he's escorting her down the aisle to her yes. premiere. So you get to see that nice parallel and you get to see the arc right there. And he but, is the comfort. And that is also a message of Disney. And I think that's yeah. one thing they were good in. But unspoken, very true. Um, and and, and the he came to life. Between it. At the end, he came to life. life. Uh -huh. yeah, so, yeah, so you it's know, not just this Much like her, thing. her uh, story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. No, I thought that was nice. The you, reuse sir? of images was very, very nice. Carpet bags, stick tree houses, all of those things were really nice. 
Um, one of the things that I really liked in the screenplay was the addition of the character Ralph. Ralph, right, yeah. I loved Ralph's no, storyline. I, I Do you have any knowledge of whether or not he was based on a real person? No, he was completely brought in. Okay. Um, Uh-oh. To... Means you might have a problem with that. But oh, okay. <laughs> luckily he's not here today. <laughs> Sorry to be doing Um but I really did. I liked his addition. I thought, it was I thought great. that he gave her. Sh- he also helped with her art yeah. simultaneously, as you're saying, the unspoken with Mickey. Right. He's the spoken right. version of that, where he he's dismissed completely mm. at the beginning. Yeah. Halfway through, you get the friendship and the bonding, and, and then right the, there, Mrs. He's Trevor. Only used to by the end of it, she's calling him by his first name. And exactly, and she gets to know him, yeah. and she finds out about his family. So but still a pill. <laughs> which is right. The only American I like, you know. <laughs> yes, and so for me. That was one of the, a key yeah. addition, yeah. and I just thought she did really need it, and it gave us you this other perspective. And also, Travers and Disney are obviously huge. We know who mm. they are, but to give us come someone new that's surprising, right. and that you don't really know at all what to expect from. What I, what, right. I, what I also like, you know, um, obviously there's more of parallel between Walt and her, but just just the way that the, the names, right, and yeah. how that was used. Because at first it's like, okay, you're just being combative, yeah, you know. Oh. But eventually, the <laughs> meaning so that good. it takes on of her wanting to use her last name, right. like call me, you know, Miss Travers, Mrs. Travers, yeah. That it, it took on so much more weight right. rather than just again a it combative, being combative or being yeah, mm-hmm. whatever, yeah. And how they, and how specifically they communicated to each other. And when they got along, how it did finally yeah. change. And at one point, she would at least call him Walter. Mm-hmm. And he was at the point that I think he was almost calling him Mrs. Travers. Mrs. Travers yeah. But it never really got through. And how that mm-hmm. exchange happened and changed yeah. throughout the movie, mm-hmm. um, I thought was done very well and mm-hmm. very artistically. All of that stuff. Yeah, I, I liked the pairs and I liked the, I liked all that stuff. Wait, okay, I thought the pairs were a little crazy. They, they were a little crazy, but you know. But what, she was a crazy woman. That, yeah, is that I'm, what? Here's let me say what I liked okay. about it. The first time she sees Pierce, she freaks out and she throws him out. And I just thought, well, what a nutcase! What the? Heck? But you know, it's gonna come back in some fashion. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, what I liked about it is that that's something a kid would do in a sense that she feels responsible for Dad's death. I think whatever in some mm-hmm. way, fashion, and so to associate something, whether it's pears or a smell or mm-hmm. uh, a, 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 a a song or whatever. That brings you back to that moment. That's what I just liked that part of it that she's still so affected by this instant in her life. She that, that I will agree with that's that I think I, is very true. And that's I think what I mean. That kids and people really do. They, we do, do it. That. We do it all the time. That I completely agree with. Yeah. But visually, their shots of the pairs yeah, were made, so bold. <laughs> um, from yeah. them pl- splashing in the pool, yeah. like. Grabbing the pears out of the basket was fine. Yeah, um, I thought that but was But the just actual dunking of the pear into the pool, it's this yeah. bright blue screen. It's just like in slow motion yeah. encapsulated in water. And then later when you get them sprawled on the floor and it's the yeah. feet shot, I was like, wow, this could be really a pear. Nice the pears. I was like, this is really yeah. pears. Here's what I liked but, about it. It, yeah, height, it. it heightened those moments. Again, going back to the mm-hmm. point that you are you know you're watching a movie, but you're enjoying it for what – because – of how beautiful it actually is. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, th- how many movies would just kind of do it and yeah. then it left for you to figure it out. But right. this, you know, the whole point of this is to kind of roadmap everything right. for you as best as it can. And, you know, obviously, if you can find the golden nuggets within that, mm-hmm. uh, all Ooh, the better for you. Are we going to talk about so, golden nuggets? So, well, the pair we is too, well, like intro? The pair is too much for it. But I got to say, I just, I thought the, the shot with the pool was cool. <laughs> the, theme of the, the theme of the pair is, the message know, of the pair is, I It was just I overdone a little bit for you. The visual right. representation but, I mean, of even, theme even the, a little overdone Even the book ending with the clouds and the, um, apparently, I didn't see it, but I've been told that there's a, the, 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 yeah, one of the clouds shape of an umbrella. I missed it completely. I was looking for Mickey. I was waiting for the, the Mickey, Mickey song. That way too much. I was like just waiting. Yeah. I was like searching for it. But in the weather vane and the winds of change and all that kind of stuff. So. Darn it. I did yeah. not get the umbrella cloud. I have to go back mm-hmm. and find it. I found a lot of the feet stuff. Yeah, a lot there's of the feet, feet stuff. Yeah, the, there was a lot the of feet stuff. Yeah, exactly. Did you catch the oh, whoosh? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was nice. A little moment there. Yeah, I got a lot of feet. Yeah. Because, so <laughs> yeah, I didn't get a lot of, of cloud. Yeah. You know, and that's the whole, you know, with this, you have to be sensitive to the to the visuals because that's obviously with with Walt Disney that's the world he created he right. created a visual, visual world that yeah. you know he wanted to bring to life mm-hmm. and to create secrets in to put that note in there it's <laughs> true it's wonderful they added it in the theme park i think that they the fact that they add these golden easter eggs goose eggs mm-hmm. in this park in every one of his ventures it keeps true to his character keeps true to his films and i really enjoy that and it also you know in that sense of it you would think from his perspective, okay, if I show her what I've done, what I've built, yeah. 
you know, uh, and been able to put from pen to life mm -hmm. that she would understand this. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't want to go to Dis with, with, with Disney. Walt? Yeah. yeah, not me. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. No, just her oh, line. Oh, oh, that's true. Not, that's right. That's, I was like, something's she's, wrong with she's you. She's sickened <laughs> by it. As they, as they say, wow, sickened by it. So. She's not interested. Mm -hmm. Not interested mm -hmm. at all. But, uh, you know, I, th I thought it was interesting the moment that never actually happened um, to between the two of them was the moment when, you know, he says, you know, I had I had Mickey and someone who wanted to take it from me. Right, so I understand yeah. what she's going through. She's saying He's saying this to the, one of the Shermans. Yes, and it was never yeah. communicated between the two of them. Right. You know, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that was interesting. Because was I, good, I thought, I thought that scene. was their greatest connection that they could, ever could have had. Mm -hmm. You know, and they uh, didn't talk about it. So. Yeah, they but never they, they, yeah. acknowledged it. Yeah. No, they, and I don't. I'm not really sure how. I was trying to figure out how true that story is. It's and not it's, quite true. Which which part are you talking about? Uh, um, well, somebody wanting. Yes, okay. Mickey. The story of Mickey mm -hmm. and how he came across and the history that oh. Walt had with creating his cartoons and. How it was told in the film, in Save Mr. Banks, it's a little exaggerated to mm -hmm. a higher stakes, mm -hmm. like, now give it to me, money, da da da, mm -hmm. image. And opposed to your reading about it, it seems like there wasn't a couple other cartoon characters involved. Mm -hmm. And I was a little. Okay, so. A little, he, here we go. Here's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a quote. Go ahead. So if it's slightly inaccurate, not my fault. <laughs> in the film, Walt Disney tries to assure Mrs. Travers that uh, he knows what it's like to have someone else control the character she's created. Which he never does because he's yeah. obviously not talking to her. No, he's talking Point to her. Uh, of quote. Uh, referencing <laughs> a New York producer who wanted to buy B Mickey Mouse. Actually, Disney and uh, um, can you pronounce that name? Erwicks. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, created Oswald the Rabbit, which yeah, Universal yeah. Studios bought and then had handed to other writers and ar artists, and Disney vowed never to work on another project he did not control. He, he and Erx would uh, later create a mouse character that Walt named uh, Mortimer. Mortimer. Uh, Mrs. Mortimer Disney mouse. insisted the name be changed to Mickey. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's well known. So I think that I think it was just a little dramatized in the movie, mm -hmm. but then again, he never even said it really to Travers. It's just well, but we don't know is if if somebody ever came to him, and, and we know about that. But who knows if somebody ever came to him and said, "No, I want to buy Mickey." It's true. We might have to do some more research on this yeah, one, yeah. or if you guys know the answer, and again, let us know. I don't think it matters. I this is where I differ with a lot of people. I don't care if, if it works in the movie. It works in the movie. It works in the mm -hmm. movie. So I don't and really care what happens. Well, here's the, okay. So I want to speak to this point because the, uh, and I thought it was a good time to theme. Yeah, like that's what I yes. I think that. I got a really big message out of when he was yeah. doing that and it impacted me. Yeah. So I do really like it. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Phil. No worries. Uh, you bring up a good point. Um, the Los Angeles Times wrote about the controversy, how uh, Walt Disney, they, they placed uh, obviously so much nicer to him versus... So that's the bottom of the thing. I know, I know, up. but I'm tying it in. Okay. <laughs> I'm tying it in. Uh, Thank you for keeping us on track. But I think... No the, the point I was making, thank you, Sarah, um, <laughs> is that... He, with the the whole movie is about image and how people stand in the pu uh, public's eye mm -hmm. or just even to themselves, right? And so I feel they they did a great service to her. You know, uh, obviously, w just in terms of Sherman alone, you know, he obviously has a newfound respect for her because though you know, rethinking yeah, he, he those days, the history now. Yeah, you know, th those were hell for him. Yeah. And so in the sense of Walt Disney, obviously, uh, we you know, you talked about him being a mogul and things like that. There's obviously a very big public image of Walt Disney and you know what I don't I wouldn't want that destroyed I wouldn't either and I think that sometimes oh, I, there's a line in this movie where they talked about it and I can't remember it but basically it's how it oh he says it um it's one of Tom Hanks's lines where he's talking to her being like you wanted me to be this horrible person you wanted me to just, disappoint oh, you funny. like everybody else this yes and it's, that's the same thing these people are critiquing it's like you're being too nice to Disney because you want to bring someone down mm -hmm. but he did all these wonderful things. You don't have to portray someone as a bad guy. I think you, he was layered. He wasn't just well, this fantastic person all the time. You did get these different images of him through this movie, and it came across the good things he did. So I was happy with it, and I was happy that Tom Hanks, though, did fight for a, a little bit of the cigarette mentioning and added in his cough. And I, th I, I liken it to this, I think, to try and sell papers because I think it's a ridiculous argument. He's not the lead in the movie. So he's not going to be as drawn as Emma Thompson, her mm -hmm. character. She's the lead in the movie. She's the one that we're going to have to learn more about. He's not, but in terms of screen time, he has about as much as Colin Farrell. It, so we're not going to know everything about him. We're not going to see every side of him. He, that, because it, it's not important for us to know every side of Disney in order for 
Emma Thompson, P.L. Travers to have her story. And I'll also and make I think this what argument. you got out of it, you've got multiple things that you got that he was a father, you got that he was a businessman, mm-hmm. you got that he was a creative personality. Mm-hmm. And in the limited screen time, for me to get all of that mm-hmm. is plenty enough. I didn't yeah. need him to be I thought, criticized. I, somebody, if you want to go do a hatchet job on him and make your own movie about Love And Fisher. try to get Disney to approve yeah, that go one. Go ahead. I, th- I thought he actually came off, uh, you know, somewhat for lack of a better term, arrogant in the sense that, you know, as soon as as soon as she said to the whole room, you yeah. know, if you think this movie is about saving the kids, by God, you don't know anything. Yeah, that's right. And they're all And kind then of, it takes him how long? It it take, him? And I was like, wait, it, it, you know, and obviously I understood at that moment because like, for me as an audience, okay, the movie's called Saving Mr. Banks. It's all about saving Mr. Banks. Come on. Doesn't he know Come on, the Disney. Movie? It's about saving Mr. <laughs> Banks. And uh, for him to have taken that long, I was I was a little bit frustrated with that. But mm-hmm. you know, I would argue then that you know it, it humanized Walt because right. he couldn't put that together. Right, because it was so uh, so layered I and mean, it's so deep in her that she's not letting it out to anybody. But that's where I went with it because yeah, clearly if 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 he knows, okay, it's not about the kids. And he's always been asking, what well, she's a conundrum. How do we find? It? Why are we having so many problems? And you'd think that he would really want to get to the heart of the matter. Of course, he's a busy guy, so maybe that's why he couldn't. But <laughs> what I liked about it is what it it showed the depth of her uh, covering all this up and mm-hmm. i mean it, it was hard for us to figure out what the heck the book was about in terms of you know because we had to wait to see what the story mm-hmm. and of course as soon as he figures it out the movie's over so of course we gotta wait <laughs> <laughs> and then you want to go back and watch the movie and yeah, make sure that you got say, that yeah. message <laughs> but i i will t- i will say this had he not had she not said that to him in the middle of the movie pretty much midpoint uh, then the ending when he finally gets there and fi- they finally have that scene where he tells his story. Are you talking about when he travels all when the way When he travels to all the way in London, he follows her. That scene doesn't anywhere near play as as good, as well as it did, unless we know that it's, it's he's been trying so long to figure it out. Yeah. Because if, if, if he learns that way too late, then that scene is not as powerful. True. Yeah, because it was all about the last name. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, it just, that all clicked. Yeah. And I think that scene, I mean, that's great. That's a wonderful Tom. That's a, his best scene in the movie for me. I'm sure you'll have other scenes that you want to talk about. Favorite we'll get to those. Tom. But um, anyway, but I, I just think the argument that it, it painted Disney in a too good of a light, and it's like, who, uh, I think that's stupid. I think it's a dumb mm-hmm. argument. And I, and I don't, I, first of all, I don't know the truth of Disney anyway. So I didn't think he would paint it in a good light. I don't think he'd paint it in a bad light. It just seemed like this is Disney for this story, such that P.L. Travers gets goes along and. I mean, here's the you could you could look at him a number of ways. I mean, just the fact that you could look at him as a smart man for having the the autographed yeah. cards already, <laughs> well, or you could be like, wow, you just yeah, there's no effort on your part to yeah, make no it kidding. specific. Exactly, I don't want. Yeah, so don't yeah, that. it's just about how you interpret it. Um, yeah. What I found interesting was um, in terms of I want to get into a little bit more into the cast. Okay. And so Tom going back, you know, he revisited kind of the old offices and things like sure. that. And he had an office there, mm-hmm. uh, and he found it funny that it's now just a storage room. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, oh, wait, Disney's office is just a storage room? No, room? his office. Oh, Tom's, Tom's actual office, okay. office um, is just a storage room. Okay, yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's and, uh, and, but, and then another great moment kind of behind the scenes was uh, he was dressed up as, um, as Disney, and he's walking around, and he walked into, you know, that office, mm-hmm. and they looked at him, and he was like, what are you guys doing? Uh, we're uh, figuring out DVD sales. He's <laughs> like, all right, carry on. <laughs> So um, I found that interesting. <laughs> nice. Just little, you know, just yeah. kind of him, you know, Walking getting into the Disney. character of Absolutely. Walt. Absolutely, yeah. That That's fun. So. That's great. Way to go, Tom. <laughs> he had a good year. I mean, this and oh, Captain very Phillips, good year. I yeah. think that. Two and of my favorite movies. There you go. Yeah, well, maybe see. Tom Hanks fan through and through, right? Uh, overall, yeah. Overall. I mean, what's the uh, what's the one with him and Julia Roberts that wasn't so good? Oh, uh, I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> yeah, see, check oh, that one out because it wasn't so good. He was in, when he got fired and had to go back to school, and she was his. Teacher. Oh, I don't know what it is. I remember anyway. what you're anyway. talking about. It was a more <laughs> recent movie. Yeah, and neither here nor there. Yeah, right, yeah. Back he directed that one too. Anyway. Oh. Let's not get into that. Okay. <laughs> You're talking. Emma Thompson I thought it was great. great She's yeah, nominated I thought, but for this, things. For me, this is Emma's movie all the way. I mean, I thought Tom, Tom did a great job. Loved him in that, especially that scene. Again, it, it, just like in the, uh, what was the movie with the colonel? Uh, Captain uh, Philip. <laughs> Captain, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> colonel, Captain, whatever it is. I was like, <laughs> that last colonel, scene, I, like th- I thought he was great in that last scene in that movie. I was like, you know, I would sit through the movie just to see that last scene and the way he mm-hmm. performed in that because I thought it was amazing. Just the way he was in that scene with her. 
uh, I'm sorry, with Emma Thompson in this last scene when he follows her to London. I'm going right there. I, I, in, in, same in Castaway when he's talking about uh, what it was like being on that island to his friend after he's been saved. I will watch that scene over and over and over again. He's for me. He just when he finds that he's a great actor for me. Completely, I, I agree. I love Emma in these roles. I mean, you guys talked about Nanny McPhee. Oh yeah. Uh, for me, it's Stranger Than Fiction. Yeah. Because that movie's just you so like much Stranger, fun. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and and she just. I again, in there, kind of like a bitchy yeah. woman. I even liked her in the one with Jeff Goldblum, and I can't remember the name of it. The one I think this is great. probably though my favorite movie that I've ever seen her in. She's terrific. Portray a writer, or just just in general. What do you she's, mean? She's like, great in this. I, I thought I, she's absolutely fantastic yeah. as an actor in this. Like, it no, I, I, I thought so too. But I'm making a joke that she's yeah. played so many writers. That's, That's true. true. Yeah. And you know, and, uh, <laughs> it was originally they wanted Meryl, and they couldn't get Meryl, and and then came. And I really, I go look at this, and I go, I mean, I'm sure Meryl would have done a fine job, but. I, it's, she it's was indelible. fantastic. Like, How do you? To me, this is this is a standout movie of her career yeah. for me. Like I will watch this over and over again. I've seen Annie McPhee. I we were talking about the parallels. The fact that that was one of the reasons she could relate to this role is because she wrote that and yeah. it does have a very similar storyline to mm-hmm. Moot Mary Poppins. Yeah. But I just thought that she really embodied this character and she didn't. There are parts of it that are so funny the, because yeah. of how bunchy and she doesn't play it for laughs. She just no, plays, she plays it just straight. straight. But I, it's hysterical because she does. Exactly, and she's so committed to it. I, and she didn't shy away to, at all from being unlikable, mm-hmm. which is a lot of actors, actors and actors. Which and and especially when you're playing with Tom As, Hanks. And you're doing the lead. So, and he's playing so Disney. Affable, you know yeah. he's going to be likable. Yeah. And just to go be very honest and with even who someone was. with all that, She's still able for me. She's still able to make you care about her and want and want for her and because you, you, I, I really want her to heal. Oh, yeah. that's so don't nice. you? Didn't you? I really liked her how she was. So I don't know. No, no. I, I, she's not. I don't think she's going to lose that okay. part of it. I don't think but that you at want all. Want her to get that? Yeah, she's still going to be irascible oh, yes. and cantankerous and all that other yes. stuff. But I just want her to heal the wound. I agree. Because yeah. I, I like that she's so spunky like that. I mean, I don't. I don't ever want her to change that part of it. I, th- I think the, one of the greatest assets was having um, Dick Sherman on set. Yeah. He, because, because every time they did, you know, she did a scene, she would go up to him and, uh, excuse me, darling, I have to now be a bitch. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, then off she went and played, you know, she yeah, had to be a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, you know, and, and, and again, so I thought that was nice because um, if she was, a, she, you know, she, uh, Sherman was able to kind of understand, mm-hmm. you know, those moments in his life. And kind of forgive them based on that performance because, because he understood. And mm-hmm. so I, I think, you know, that connection, mm-hmm. you know, really worked well in creating this character on screen. And I don't know, obviously, I've never met Emma Thompson, but on, well, when, whenever I see her on the talk shows or whatever, interviews mm-hmm. and stuff, I, she's incredibly affable and likable and mm-hmm. wonderful and sweet and all that other stuff. And I just, and I just like that she, I'm, I'm sure it was a thrill for her to play somebody that didn't care and just said <laughs> horrible things and got to be a bitch for however many days. So, but I think that was a good stretch for her because I I often don't see her in a role where she's playing somebody like this. She's so prim and proper, and yeah. and Emma Thompson to me is, is she's off the cuff. She's very improvisational. She's very crazy, and she's oh, not at all t- wrapped that tightly at all. I would totally agree with that. Screen definitely break from character, break from yeah. who she is. Oh, I would say end, Colin. That's Colin kind gonna of a you, you know I. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of his more recent works. I mean, Fright Night for me is what comes to mind. Who are we talking about? Colin, Colin Farrell. Farrell. Oh, okay. Who played drunk? Dad. Got it. Oh, okay. I see. I'm sorry. And so, Mr. For, Banks. Yes, thank you. You know, so for for me with, with him, um, you know, I was, I knew he was gonna, be, you know, based off of the uh, posters and that he was gonna mm-hmm. be in this movie, and I didn't know I what didn't to think of that. All. I did, yeah, I didn't know what I to think no of idea. it, but no, um, but I didn't even know. I was like, yeah, "What the I hell is no Colin idea. doing in here?" Yeah, I had yeah no he idea. did a good job. He did a great job. I thought he you was know, and I, I didn't think there was a bad po- uh, role in this. I didn't. No, no one took it, stood no. out to me as like not belonging. All of them really, yeah, fit together as a cast. He did joke about it. He was like, "Wait, I'm playing Emma Thompson's father." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How'd that happen? So, so uh, but you know, he he said, uh, "I want to bring a humanity to to the character and things like that." And um, it's quite unfortunate that you know this character can't and he see. He teared up when he watched the whole film. Did you he hear did. about this? Oh, I did hear that. Oh, he, yeah, yeah, he cried. Yeah. He cried a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, it was like Good a tear, mm-hmm. but he admitted to it, and he admitted that he felt so mm-hmm. moved, but that he was embarrassed because it was his own film, and you're not supposed to cry. You're supposed to cry your own film. <laughs> but here's the thing, you know, one of the toughest things for him was he had to bottle up the the whole fact that. He, you know his no demise pun. was his own. Yeah, and and he could never admit that. 
as his character, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and that was one of the toughest things. And so, you know, to be able to portray that, um, you know, basically someone who doesn't want to look in the mirror and admit their no. own faults. Mm-hmm. Doesn't want to deal with reality. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. He wants to live in the fantasy world. You know, and I, I think, again, uh, you know, you spoke that you didn't even know that he was in there. I didn't. I think he forgot, as he's watching, he's yeah, like, he oh, who's that guy? Exactly. That guy's that good. good. Yeah. And he, yeah, he did a great job. Yeah, and, again, and I thought Ruth Wilson, who played his wife, uh, and Ginty's mother, Thought she was terrific for the you know because she wasn't on screen time but I even she but he was made, he was he was made very lovable early yeah. on oh, you yeah. didn't oh, you know yeah. what I mean you just think he's the best dad in the world look at how he treats his daughter oh my god you know oh, we're gonna yeah. walk together yeah. we're all set um and just so creative and imaginative and then uh, yeah. it just all and you and realize, you're like who is oh. the, you know with Ruth I was like who is this woman why is she so yeah. bitter you know I understand he he lives a slightly. Different. Irresponsible. Yeah. Life. No, not ir- well. Yeah, I guess yeah, irresponsible. Yes, irresponsible. Early on, you could say what that is. <laughs> okay, irresponsible early on because you know he had a different outlook on life. But then obviously, when the drugs came in, that was a whole different story. Well, I mean, he, was, he got fired a couple of times. I mean, he was He didn't show up to work because exactly. he wanted He's to play drinking. a game. He's not going to take care of his family. I mean, irresponsible. The, 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 you know the. Uh, the but there's a the difference. Between, there's diff- there's, there's, there's the, obviously there's a huge difference between a drunk. Yeah, and versus someone that's just kind of uh, with a different philosophy. And, and, no, the philosophy is fine, but it, he took the philosophy to the degree that he couldn't deal with reality. That's why he was running away from it. He just wanted to deal on the flights of fancy. And, he didn't want to have to deal. I mean, that's why he drank so much. And it's fun because it's a different perspective on people who do do mm-hmm. our drugs or addicts or yeah. whatever. Because we do normally see the angry, mm-hmm. evil, bad, and that's not always true. No. They're very happy. He was drunk. a lovable just, drunk. Exactly. And I liked that they added mm-hmm. that and that you could see and why it still wreaks havoc on your kid. And it still yeah. destroys, can destroy yeah, families exactly. and the mother's relationship. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, I loved it. I just, well, the, what I was pointing to in terms of Ruth Wilson is that, you know, when she has that moment where she just can't take it anymore and she says goodbye to her daughter, I was just going, oh my God, I felt so bad for not only the kid but for her. And you could, she was just out of her own body and just walking in. And That's when it was not a PG thirteen. That's movie. true. That was, but, but, that was a, but the the way she, they did that scene when her, when her when her daughter hang, you know, she's in the water yeah. or whatever, and looks like, uh, and she yanks on her mother's thing. She turns around, she realizes what she's doing and what she could be possibly putting this child through. And then you could see it all. I mean, it was great. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. But uh, you guys want to talk about uh, the movie Mary Poppins? Not not the movie, but the. <sighs> What are you the, talking the aunt, about? The aunt. Oh, okay, absolutely. Yeah, oh. Rachel Griffiths. Oh. Yeah, I was, was going to try to figure out how to yeah, explain exactly. it. The real Mary Poppins. The, the, yes. The real person that Mary Poppins was based on. Although, yes. although the argument that Disney makes, uh, Tom Hanks makes in the movie, is that um, it, it's her. It's Travers. It's yes. her creation. Meaning, she because in is real life she Mary wasn't. Poppins. You know, because that's what she was. wasn't. She couldn't fix everything, but Mary yeah. Poppins can, and that's what that's the device that yes. P.L. Travers creates in it's, order to help her through this. It's the dream scenario of, of what she wished had happened yes. and how things were supposed exactly. to turn that's out. That's right. Yeah, because she couldn't fix everything. Nope. Because, uh, but, but I loved when she came. I was like, oh my god, Rachel, <laughs> they got her through it. She got the hair all out, and, and she gives you those little tidbits of lines, yeah. especially her delivery of the yes, codfish exactly. line was fantastic. We are not the codfish, yeah. And then you, she's got the iconic bag that she's pulling all kinds of crap out of. <laughs> I, thought, I, th- I thought what worked really nice, uh, again going back to the script, was that you, you know the, he never wanted her to come. Remember, it was always a point of contention. Oh, yeah, he wife. didn't want the, the... I'm sorry, you are talking about her father, so Mr. Yeah. Travers. With, with the wife, it was like... Yeah, he no, never wanted no. the aunt to come, yeah. You know, and, and I, I found it was funny that yeah. she ultimately became Mary Poppins because she's supposed to, you know, mm-hmm. with him, yeah. don't come. Absolutely, because she... <laughs> yeah, she, she so, goes with, yeah. I found that quite fun. That was good. Are we going to talk about Golden Eggs now? Uh, uh, well, you know, so, since we're kind of talking about... It, in terms of... They shot this in Australia. Yeah. All right. All right, we're going to locations. Move on. Go ahead. Sure, locations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they no, shot in L.A. But this part's they were, they were shot in uh, England. I heard, was, I heard it was okay. Go ahead. But uh, maybe no. There's three locations. Right. Gotcha. There's three I'm locations. Go, go with the United this. States. Gotcha. Which obviously, you know, it's not like they made Disney in uh, over in Australia. They no. went to the real place, mm-hmm. so they shut down for you know that down for a few days. But in terms of Australia, they wanted to make sure that it was shot um, completely anamorphic and mm-hmm. you know really kind of uh, wide. Right. To, to show you know the natural beauty and things yeah. like that. Okay. So Sorry, I found that imperial. interesting. You okay. thought it was in the United States, right? Yeah, I read and I went, "What?" I, I, read I where? didn't believe it. I I can't what? remember where I read. We were, you know, L.A. Times that's criticizing yeah, exactly. the movie <laughs> that they they shot in L.A. I went, "Wow, okay, I guess I could have passed for it, you know, because they've done other things." So, no, 
Well, the the opening image when you saw the clouds and saw the palm trees, I didn't guess. And when I saw the palm trees, I said, "Oh, because well, Disney." I thought we're in L.A. for sure, right? And then they say, "No, we're in Australia." And I went, yeah, "Okay." I I, I agree with Asha. I totally thought we were opening yeah, together, open in like Disney, yeah, California, exactly, Hollywood, so. and I was like, "Oh, we're somewhere else." Well, yeah, I'll take it though. So, yeah, that's all. Fair enough. There you go. Locations. So, what are the, uh, What else did you? Okay, let's... they did shut down Disneyland for two days. Mm-hmm. I believe it was what November. Well, 6th well portions and they did portions yes, at a the time. The Magic Castle yes. was a big mm-hmm. center, and um, I must. I wonder if people were mad or happy about that. <laughs> I yeah, that know. they had shut down portions <laughs> of the park. Yeah, I don't know. But they're shooting yeah. in Disney films, yeah, so exactly. you're happy because that's yeah. happening, right? But they got to see Walt walk around, right? Whole yeah, it was like, who's that? Yeah. Oh, Walt. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> There you go. Well, we had, we were still talking about actors. We didn't really. Is there anything else we wanted to say in terms? Of, I thought the little girl that played Ginty was wonderful. She she did she did really good. Um, I guess we could talk about the uh, the the writer, the screenplay. Author, okay. You know, and well, I was uh, finishing up on actors. Do you, are we done? No, on I'm actors? talking about the a, the actors. Oh, you're talking about okay, great. The actor, you yeah. know, um, who are you talking about? Okay, it's tough when you're talking about a movie <laughs> that's about a movie. He's talking about Bradley Whitford. I'm talking. And he yeah. played BJ the Novak. co-writer. Brothers. Yes. Well, yeah. Oh, you're talking about the, the everyone. Okay, the those three writers. Of them. Yes. Okay, three gotcha. of them. Yeah. So the lyricist and the composers and the the, and the screenplay. screenplay. Screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They was great. I love the guys in the room. They they were so put upon. I like when Brad. See what's his name? Really, you've just infuriated me. I Which love one? the drawings because those came also from yeah, come from reality. Reality, and he had sketches of her, and yeah. so that was really pulled from. And the fact that he the um, what's his name had the cane with the shot in his leg. Right. I thought that was gonna get explained at some point, but I didn't. No, it did. Oh, remember because okay. because of World War Two. No, it didn't get explained. It didn't what get explained happened? In the movie. Just told him it was shot. He just the reality shot. is that it would happen in war. Yeah, I just assumed. And it's because ironic of the, yeah. because she's like, oh, he deserved to get shot. Or something, because she yeah, thinks she she's said no that. No, she said it figures. Or something, or like, something, that. something yeah, like, like that. that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I knew that, but you guys, you guys, oh, okay. No, I'm saying I thought in the movie at some point that would come back, like they'd have a, she and he mm-hmm. would have a conversation, and he, she would learn that he got shot in the war, and nope. she, no, and no. it never happened. Fair enough. That's all. Nope. But that did happen in real life. So. Yes, of course. So. There you go. I but you were saying, who was saying that somebody you didn't like was one of the... I actually really what is his name in this? I can't remember. The guy who did do was playing um the writer. Don uh, DeGrabby. Or DeGrady, excuse me, DeGrady, whatever. Uh, he name. was driving me crazy. Is it because he's in Billy Madison as the uh, evil jerk? No. But why no. is he driving you crazy? Okay, like when they started doing Let's Fly a Kite mm-hmm. and he was on his knees yeah. and they brought um the assistant in and he's like, Daddy <laughs> or something. I was literally like I would have hated thinking about this movie too if you were reading well, yeah. it like that. Well, that, but that was his job. He was supposed to. I mean, he wasn't supposed to, but because he was horrible, that made it more difficult for I get it. PL. I just, it just really put me on her side, where I would just yeah. be like, "No, no, <laughs> we're not making this film." So he was so good at making it bad, and it's horrible. Yeah. Oh no! So yeah. well, I thought his accent was just as good as Dick Van Dyke's. I have to say. <laughs> oh, can we t- uh, can we talk about Dick Van Dyke for a moment? Sure, go right ahead. Um, not in this movie, but n- go ahead. Well, not, not, briefly in a cameo. At um, the end. He's mentioned a lot. Well, he's his in the name ca- is he, referred he to at the end. Uh, well, obviously she didn't. Uh, she didn't want him at all. No. Uh, she also supposedly didn't really actually want Julia Andrews either. They just couldn't put in that she didn't like either people in the movie, so they she focused like mostly the film, on. So. Yes, she okay. focused most on here's Dick a, Van here's Dyke. A, here's a fun nugget. Uh, Travers never did approve uh, casting of Dick Van Dyke as Burt in pre-production mm-hmm. of Mary Poppins. Although he claimed that it was the best film he was in, uh, Van Dyke felt he was miscast to play Burt and said either uh, Jim Dale or Ron Moody should have yeah. been cast as Burt. Jim Dale would have been great. Um, Travis suggested actors like uh, Richard Burton, Alec Guinness, <laughs> Richard Harris, Rex Har- Harrison, not Ron a casting Moody, director, <laughs> uh, Lorison Oliver, Peter O'Toole, and Peter Sellers for the role in keeping with the British nature of her right. books. Mm-hmm. Even Travers and Walt Disney both favored Stanley Holloway for Burt, but Holloway had to turn down the role due to his obligation on reprising his stage role of. Um, uh, do a little for the film version of Leonard and Lowe's My Fair Lady, which later became Mary Poppins' chief competitor in 1964. Interesting. So he made, he mm. made a good film choice, at least for him. Oh, absolutely. Though. And yeah, I'd like you know a lot of people give him grief, but I, he knew that he was miscast. But he said, you know, he, he took the role obviously for many reasons. But uh, you know, he knew his accent was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. well, so what? what He's like, do? I got it in a minute. That's so it. Here I'm you gonna go. do my best. There you go. And but I thought I thought it was very funny because. 
it was like I understood kind of why she was against Dick Van Dyke sure. because of where she's well, coming he's an from. American TV but actor. I think it's funny editing wise for the movie that they also left out that she was unhappy with Julie Andrews. Yeah. And I think that's more because people are so such advocates yeah, yeah. of Julie Andrews sure. that the moment you're like, No, no Julie Andrews, people are like, Oh, we can't respect your opinion you know, anymore. <laughs> I don't think she was in favor of anything. No. No. I'm agreeing with her on the penguins, though. I you, said that earlier. Yeah, I'm not like a fan the of the animated penguins. <laughs> Are you okay with the merry-go-round horse and stuff? Not my favorite part. Not, your not favorite. my favorite so part. So the animated part of Mary Poppins is not a fan. I mean, I love the movie, but that's mm. my least favorite part okay, of the movie is the it. right. animation it craziness. <laughs> it's weird. Those horses are weird. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> okay. They're Thank weird. you, Sarah. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's see. I don't, uh, we've been talking about all the, well, just about all the actors, but I thought the guys, uh, BJ Novak and uh, Schwartzman, did a great job mm-hmm. as the Sherman brothers. It was fun to see them. I, I, I love their story. I wish they'd do a story on those guys. They did, turned out such great musicals. <laughs> Here's, uh, so, um, you know, they were at, the whole cast was kind of asked this. Did you guys watch the movie mm-hmm. before you shot? And uh, Colin, I guess, had invited everyone to go to, mm-hmm. to see the movie at his place. And, uh, you know, they spent three hours talking that eventually he felt like, oh, I guess we should watch the movie. So he put it on. And, you know, the, you know there was about 20 of them, he says. Um, I don't know exactly who, but I know Tom and Emma. Right. And, mm-hmm. you know, those guys were definitely there. And uh, that he says that really brought him close as a cast. Mm-hmm. Okay, nice. Way to go, you Colin. Know. And he so. wasn't even in the movie with him. <laughs> he wasn't. <laughs> he never did a scene with him. <laughs> never. So, but it brought them together. So but right. they could all go to the premiere and be friends. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's the whole point. Is the end that's premiere right. is you want everyone to be happy and be friends. <laughs> so you can promote the movie better? Or <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Or you well, get... look, uh, th- for most of uh, this movie, uh, the accolades have gone to the writing for mm-hmm. uh, uh, Kelly and two, and uh, especially the acting for uh, Tom and uh, Emma. Emma. And very little said about the direction, which I find interesting. They, how you know? It's, uh, most people think this is a, is a good movie, but they aren't talking about the director, and I find that kind of strange. True. I mean, I can't, I can't really blame them because I haven't been either. Yeah. Um. So, because really, when I do talk about this, I talk about the story, the narrative, and yeah. particularly Emma Thompson. Right. I really haven't paid too much attention to the director, which is well, bad okay. on my part. Sorry. Um, he hasn't. He hasn't directed uh, John Lee Hancock. Hasn't yeah. directed many movies. Well, he did Blindside. He did Blindside uh, and the Alamo, but and the Rookie, even Snow White and the Huntsman, A Perfect World. I mean, so um, and you know, I, I would I would just guess that a guy that did Blindside, which uh, hey, look, won Academy Award mm-hmm. for um, Sandra, mm-hmm. but here's and it the got thing. a lot it, of attention. So it mm-hmm. did, but you it's know, nominated as well. It's interesting because there's there's obviously movies that you look at like you know American Hustle with David O. Russell, right, uh, or Christopher Nolan, or any, right. you know, you associate the director with the movie, right. Blindside, you know, had you told me, I wouldn't have been like, oh, John Lee Hancock. Right. You know, you're more like Sandra Bullock, yeah. or the story's great, or whatever. Yeah, but you know I mean, I, mean? I, th- I, 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 I think... I think, but I, I don't think know if it's, it's an a choice. argument for marketing. He just doesn't market himself. I, I, I or, or that's what I'm saying. I, th- I think he but just, I don't think he that just makes likes, it, he just... He's low-key about it? Is he's low-key, and he wants to, you know, he uh, just even in the interviews, he doesn't speak much, but, you know, he joked about it like... Um, you know, how did you come across this movie? He was like, well, I wanted to make another one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, given that I want to tell, you know, yeah. these certain types of stories, you know, sometimes it takes about 10, 12 years yeah. for, you know, then to Something come to like fruition. It. Right. And so I took on this one. Yeah. There you go. And he yeah. does a good job though. So. And again, I think I, I, I commend quantity him. Quantity of a quantity. I commend him for making it less about him. Yeah. You know, I think uh, y- there's definitely a style there. Is it his is it the signature John Lee Hancock style? Mm-hmm. I would say no because it's bl- you know, look at Blindside versus Rookie versus yeah. this. Yeah, you know, whole set of different skills. Yeah, but it just yeah, shows but they his... do draw from real stories mm-hmm. and real people. And he, I think, he does a good job of being able to read yeah. people well and illustrate them mm-hmm. in a proper light that balances, you know, the good sides and bad sides mm-hmm. of people, and not creating them into anything that's perfect. But people who are kind of have raw edges Mm -hmm. so i think that that's where his skill lies i'm just i i think that at this point we ought to give him his two i think that people should be talking about not just the actors and the writing in this one because nothing that it's a collaborative effort but obviously the director's he's running the show so he's obviously doing something right i mean i i 100 agree but i i think but i mean how can you not i mean that's like that's true it's how can you not be talking about him and here's the thing sometimes you have to be loud Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think he's loud. 
You know, no, he's not. But what I'm saying is not him. I'm just saying. Well, I'm just surprised that everybody out there isn't also talking about his and his ability to put this movie together. I I would agree. <laughs> I don't know how to fix this problem. Which no, we don't have to fix it. Strong. I just, I just we gotta save we gotta save Mr. Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right, all right. Well, I don't know what else. Well, because I thought in terms of direction, I thought it was done very well. It was the balance was great. Sure. And then, you know, just Put just a good team together. Just mm-hmm. the way it was acted, and, and again, going back to the visuals and things like mm-hmm. that. And you know, we spoke the reds and yeah. things like that. You know, making the conscious choice of when to place in reds yeah. and and how it all tied together. By the way, the. Uh, when when the two worlds collide with yeah. that song, mm-hmm. just the sheer filmmaking. Uh, and that uh, was obviously the that, moment. That was a good for thing Phil. for Phil. Yeah, Phil that, loved he really the kicked America it into gear Ram. there. That man. was like because it was it was perfection on all levels: writing, acting, mm-hmm. music, cinematography, editing. Yeah. Uh, you know what? What there's not, not one thing wrong with it. Yeah. There you go. You loved it. I did love it. Do you also like merry-go-rounds? But here's the thing. But you just no. Made that this point. is the merry-go-round. But, but I know what I'm saying. And do don't you, you like... and don't you give that credit to the director? He's the one that put that I all do. together. I do. You got to. But again, he be, you know it's funny seeing him because he just uh, he was complimented so about that and he just go. dismissed it. Really? Yeah. He just pretty much okay. And what was your question? <laughs> well, okay, maybe that's why people don't talk about him more. I, I to your point. So, all right. What do we got? Some golden nuggets, Phil. Let's get into those. What do you want to talk about? Oh, golden nuggets. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, so uh, the super califragilistic expialidocious yeah. moment um, of you know in the in the real movie, um, Mr. Banks says, "What? I always know what to say," and, and obviously they tie that. What what I love is uh, again they layered all these different things, but they never made it a point to take away from the movie. Right. And uh, you know we could probably spend forever talking about the various ones, but I, I thought that one was fun. Um, you know, uh, obviously saving Mr. Banks, right? It's about mm-hmm. saving Mr. Banks. So in the movie, what I liked about it, you know, uh, Bert says to the kids, like, who looks after your father? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's how yeah. that came into existence. I thought right. that was nice. Um, Spoonful of Sugar, I believe you yeah. talked about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what about you guys? What What are some golden nuggets that they put in? Well, those are the ones that I really enjoyed. Those ones that I remember. I'm sure there were a ton of them. And I, as I was watching the movie, I was going, ah, that's where they, that, I get it. They, so I was doing a lot of that, but I can't recall them at the moment. I didn't write them down. <laughs> I would say the ones I was most drawn to are actually the ones um, related to Travers and just her actions. And I, I felt very like drawn to her movements and how she really influenced mm-hmm. Mary Poppins. Kind of you could tie in those parallels I mentioned earlier, like just her tapping her feet. Yeah, her way she I definitely. loved that. Yeah, that was true. Also, um, how they did tie in throughout the piece the um, talking. Um, Umbrella head right, and uh-huh. how it also transferred to actually it was in the Aus- Australian uh-huh. in her uh-huh. actual hand yeah. and the carpet bag through different people yeah, throughout exactly. the film. Um, those are the ones that are hitting my head right um, now. Obviously, the mustache was a point of contention. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I you know um, I don't think that's necessarily a nugget mm-hmm. as more of a yeah. you know plot device at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was nice and like oh, of course he's gonna have a mustache you know M- Walt specifically wanted that <laughs> um there was the one i read about where there's the f- um a map of florida oh in yes walt disney's office which is where he was going to build disney world mm-hmm. but he hadn't built it yet mm-hmm. that was one that was mm-hmm. in there he got off the phone with ge mm-hmm. right um you know one quick moment obviously mm-hmm. uh to what that led to um Let's see. Uh, in terms of how London looks specifically, obviously that was a big point of contention. Mm-hmm. But I like that's not how their house looks. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like this. Uh, I thought that was fun. And again, it was just it was just great to see the making of this process. Uh, mm-hmm. This isn't a golden nugget particularly, but um, in terms of in the actual movie, but it's a golden nugget about the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so they they recorded all the songs right. Um, and they got to use, uh, you know, a lot of the old pianos and things like that. And there was, um, so everyone had left and they had about, uh, as John, John Lee says, um, about 20 minutes, right? Mm-hmm. Extra. And so, you know, he was like, can we record, um, Chim Chimney? Mm-hmm. You know, Chim and- Chim Marie? Yes. Okay. I'm not great with the song titles, so forgive <laughs> me on that. You know, I, that I, I grew, I saw Mary Poppins. I liked Mary Poppins. Mm-hmm. I am not. The yeah. fanatic that other people are with songs. Okay. Um. So they had uh Walt Disney's old kind of piano, 
right? Mm -hmm. It was just used for you know things rehearsal like this. rehearsal yeah. piano, right? Yeah. And then I, I guess it's an upright. I didn't know that there was a difference. Yeah, there's but, a difference. But apparently there's a difference. Yeah. And so they recorded it, you know, on that piano. Mm -hmm. And later on, you know, um, he didn't know that he would end up using it for the movie and things like that. And they were like, should we get this recorded? And then he was like, no, 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 don't, because you know this whole movie is about the creative process. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay that it's not a fine tune piano or right. whatever you want to call okay. it. What do you call a fancy piano? A concert piano. There you go. Concert piano. <laughs> I learned that. Grand I didn't know. Piano. I didn't know that there was a difference in pianos. Yeah. But I thought I thought that was uh, pretty cool. That was cool. You know, to you know include that in in that raw form. Yeah, no, I think that's no. great. I'm glad you said that. I didn't know that. I All that research either. paying off, though. Way to go. <laughs> Hopefully. You learned something about pianos yeah. and the film. Well, we just talked about music. Let's go deeper into that because a lot of this, obviously, they're using the songs that are uh, mm -hmm. made by the Sherman Boys uh, for Mary Poppins. But let, I do have, uh, Stephen, uh, let me know when you're ready to cue it up. There's a, it's, a, it's a small little thing that I, would, I do mm -hmm. want to play for us. Okay. What is it? Um, it's, a, it's a video about the music, and it's, and okay, it's with, the, um, with, I believe, Dick Sherman speaking about it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, are we, are we ready? I, uh, on your cue, Stephen. Again, I, I I thought you know rather than you know we could, I wanted to discuss it after Save we Mr. heard Banks this. Okay, it's quite go. a remarkable film. Well, Bob and I got the great opportunity to work for Disney, and what finally happened was we'd written about seven or eight songs that he had put in his films and in television shows, and he handed us a book, and the book was Mary Poppins by Pamela Travers. And he said, "Read this and tell me what you think." One of the most endearing things about the film, and it gets you from the very beginning. This is, is Randy Thornton sort of talking. Pulls you in. And this is true with just about all Disney films, particularly in the early days. The songs were there to help tell the story, to move it forward. And I was in charge of the master tapes and everything, and I'd come across the Mary Poppins pre-demo. And these are all the original recordings. Now, when Poppins was in production, it was on again, off again, on again, off again. And Bob and Dick decided to take the songs they had written to that point and record them and put them down on tape. And that's what this reel is. For the Saving Mr. Banks deluxe edition soundtrack, we've included four of these original demos in their entirety. And Chim Chim Cheri uh, came along uh, during one of the story meetings, I think before Travers even came out here. They were talking with Don DeGrotti about you know their storyline and everything. And, and Don was just sort of sketching. And it was a sketch of a chimney sweep and we asked about it, what's he all about? And he said, well, Mary Poppins shakes hands with him and the children say he's so filthy. And, he's, and Mary Poppins says, don't you realize it's luck when you shake with a sweep? And that was kind of a cue for us. And so basically we, we were inspired by that, song, that drawing and we wrote uh, the song that was lucky for us, you know? Chim chimney, chim chimney, chim chim cheree. A sweep is as lucky as lucky can be. Chim chimney, chim chimney, chim chim cheroo. Good luck will rub off when I blow hands with you. Or blow me a kiss, and that's lucky too. When Mary takes Jane and Michael on their excursion into the park, um, the Shermans felt that they needed to bring something back with them, some sort of talisman, and they really didn't have a quite an idea of what to do until they remembered crazy long word uh, from their childhood. So they created supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. We started with obnoxious, uh, super colossal, uh, super colossal, uh, very ordinary, and then we, we sort of piddled around with it, played around with it, and, and we didn't want to have obnoxious, but we had atrocious because it sounded more British. And so we'd have atrocious, and then you'd be smart, you'd be precocious, and so there we had precocious, docious at the end, and so we had the bottom of the song, and we didn't have the top. And so we started with super colossal and dropped the colossal, of course that's, everybody would say super colossal, so we said super, then just pure double tongue, califragilistic, expialidocious. It you know, took us two weeks to come up with it, and it goes something like this. Um diddle little little um diddle I um diddle little little um Because I was afraid to speak when I was just a lad Me father gave me nose a tweak and told me I was bad But then one day I learned a word that saved me aching nose The biggest word you ever heard and this is how it goes It's supercalifragilistic expialidocious Even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious If you say it loud enough you'll always sound precocious Supercalifragilistic <laughs> the pivotal point in the film. There's a little bit more, but I, um, I figured it'd give us a chance to talk music. When Mary sings, Feed the Birds. 
Mm -hmm. And the whole thing from the beginning was, you know, Mary isn't there to save the children. She's really there to save Mr. Banks. Walt obviously knew it was a keystone moment. Working with Walt Disney was a very special time because he was so cooperative and so listenable. I mean, he would listen and he would plus things that we'd come up with. He realized that we were trying to say a lot more with a very few words than could possibly be said. And that was that it doesn't take much to give love, but you have to give it freely. And it doesn't cost a nickel, it costs tuppence. Once he saw that, he said, that's the key to the whole picture. And it was his favorite song and became my favorite song too. Tuppence a bag, tuppence, tuppence, tuppence a bag. Feed the birds, that's what she cries, while overhead her birds fill the skies. All around the cathedral, the saints and apostles look down as she sells her wares. Although you can't see it, you know they are smiling each time someone shows that he cares. Yeah, I always loved that song. That, that was very special to me. Years after Poppins was, was made. All right, we can stop there, Stephen. Thank you. But, um, yeah, nice little breather for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I wanted to, you know, it's great to kind of get it from their perspective and, and, and hear it from them. Um, Let's see, what is he going to say? Talking um, about music. Talking about music. Or well, do you want to talk about the original score? Like how they interpreted well, I about both in this. Yeah, I think yeah, you have to talk about both. Mm -hmm. Because I think, you know, in a way, this movie's lucky. It already has Needs to get, yeah. iconic, great mm -hmm. songs to draw from. Mm -hmm. And they do play a big part in this film, yeah. time wise. They really did hit on a lot of the songs mm -hmm. and live out a lot of them fully. I want to say, like, Let's Fly Kites, the entirety of that song yeah. is presented. Um, but I did like that they you got the broken down version, yeah. the rehearsal version. Yeah. It's not to the quality we're used to. It's not these professional mm -hmm. singers. It is sung by, you know, two gentlemen. It's in a rehearsal hall. Yes. Yeah, it's not and polished. That, it's not And they're so produced. great and yeah. they're so fun. And so in that way, they're lucky. Mm -hmm. But then also how the composer broke it down, specifically in the beginning and the end of this film, and how mm -hmm. you kind of got the almost twisted version mm -hmm. Of that's how it read to yeah. me of like the east winds and the east. It's this kind dark and yeah. scary. It's and, a little foreboding. And I but I really liked it. Yeah. And I thought it was very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um so I was a big fan of how they intertwined the two and how I got a variety, but it, it paid a good homage to the original. Mm -hmm. Um what did you guys think? I um uh, I loved um the original score which was done by um uh, shoot, what's his name, John? If you have it, jump in. But uh, he did Thomas he, Newman. Yes, he did, yeah. He's done um, all these um, obviously animated movies for Pixar, Wall right? E. Finding Nemo yeah. and things like that. And so I, th I found that this interesting. This is his first live action, correct? Yes. Live action Disney. Live action Disney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I found that interesting because you know there there is a difference uh, to kind of doing live action versus animation. Obviously, animation um, tends to. Uh, for lack of a better term, fun. You know, you can have fun with it. It can be more whimsical, you know, and childlike. Whereas here, I mean, we talked about it. It's it's not quite a children's movie, mm -mm. so you have to you have to play that. Especially, you know, um, I forget what music was playing when when the suicide attempt was happening. Yeah, I don't remember. But don't remember. you have to play that really yeah. smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chim Chimmy wouldn't go as well there. Yeah, what's not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to make it really dark and twisted <laughs> to work on that one. So, yeah. but I felt like the music blended well from. Although we got, you know, the two dual stories, I yeah. didn't feel like either. I thought more visually opposing than sound opposing between mm -hmm. the two. Um, I'd have to re-listen to just the score. I think that mostly what I was taking around from sound was so much tied to the Mary Poppins, mm -hmm. just because hearing it in this different manner was so interesting to me that that was drawing my attention more than just like the composing in the background mm -hmm. throughout the film. But um, in the times I did notice it which was a lot of like the landscape shots or shots of the sky or whatnot, I did feel very carried away with it. And from the very beginning, I did 
feel that this was a Disney movie f- just through the sound and through the music. And that's always such an important part, even through the creepy. But like when you opened yeah. up on the clouds, uh-huh. it was very dreamlike to me. Wow. It was very okay. transporting to the and, world. And it harkened to, to Disney for you. The beginning. Yeah. The beginning mm-hmm. opening. I, I definitely felt like I was going into a Disney film. Interesting. I, I don't really have a memory of that. I mean, I don't, I, I know I wasn't transported mm-hmm. to thinking that, but I, it, for me, the mu- I thought they, they used the, uh, uh, existing music of Mary Poppins so well, mm-hmm. I thought. Yeah. Uh, and then the the stuff that Thomas provided. For me, it, w- it just, it, I liked that he was able to bend and twist and tweak mm-hmm. and, you know, use the themes or whatever it is. And I don't speak music very well, mm-hmm. pardon me. Uh, it's the melody language. line. I don't, I don't, I don't know music He thought very the volume well. was correct. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but I just like that he was able to use them, but... but you know, alter them slightly, like you said, so they had different. They they resonated differently than, mm-hmm. the, than, than the songs that I was used to, and 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 for the stuff that was all new, uh, I thought it just it really served its purpose well. It never felt. It, I just think it supported what was going on more than anything. It just felt that it was really congruous that mm-hmm. way. The only thing that I could have wanted was I know that they del- um had a lot more songs written for the original score that never made it to the film. Oh, is that? I, I think so. Yeah, and I really wanted kind of a tidbit of something else they had experimented with because we got yeah. all songs that were that yeah. did make it through even despite if she liked them or not uh-huh. like, i really wanted something they that, didn't that they like didn't make it? to oh, see that would have been interesting yeah. um just because like i wanted to see more of that mm-hmm. side because this was the making of and mm-hmm. that's tidbits that people always enjoy so right. that was uh, something i was waiting for that didn't happen mm. but that's okay i'll forget <laughs> <them>. Fair <enough. laughs> um you know i for me what i liked it Again, it's 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 just the perfect marriage of all these different things. So it starts with the acting, mm-hmm. then goes into the visual, and then you know because I'm making the visual ties to Mary Poppins and what's mm-hmm. going on on screen, and then the music is you know one of the last levels from f- to hit for me, mm-hmm. and um, so the the combination of all worked really well. And it, it, as you said, I, I think everyone on this project just really understood it. You know, they yeah, understood they, what they, they were like going. They were all making the same movie. You know, there are a lot of times when you're watching a movie and you're going, I don't think the editor's on the same page with the uh, production designer or something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You can see mm-hmm. there seems to be some dissonance. Yeah. There they seems seem to be on the same. Connect. Yeah. They seem to be all on the same page on this one, which was great. Yeah, it flowed. And it's, and it's interesting, you know, again, they, they get asked so many times, you know, did you see Mary Poppins beforehand? Or like, well, you know, what weight did Mary Poppins have? And it, it's, it would seem like that would be your Bible. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, like when, when, for example, when Lord of the Rings is spoken about, and yeah. Peter Jackson, he always has a book and this and yeah. that. <laughs> and you know what? They were just—it's it, it almost like a side note. They uh-huh. took the spirit of Mary Poppins and and what it was, but they didn't. You know, it's not like everyone had a DVD copy mm-hmm. playing everywhere throughout the set or wherever they were, just to make sure. Ah, oh, did we get that right? You know? Yeah, they were referential, but they weren't—they uh, weren't remaking anything. This was mm-hmm. not a sequel or anything like that, or a prequel. Whatever but you so, call but it. you know, you could you, you know, uh, you could see there. I. You know, in other filmmakers' hands, you could see where they would try to do that, yeah. and it, it would suffer f- just yeah. from that. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You know, rather than you know, they they knew each other's skill sets, and they were just like, okay, let's do it. You know, we know what we want to make. So I, I, I thought that resonated well. Um, the, by the way, the video we watched, um, it's uh, it's on YouTube um, under the channel Disney. Uh-huh. There's a lot of great videos like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't have a lot of views, ironically. So check them out because they are little golden nuggets. Yeah, just watching Sherman again. That's Dick Sherman, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I that guy's great. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's determinably <laughs> optimistic and happy and funny. Yes. Uh, and embracing his song. Yeah, his he's piano. terrific. I, I just, and if if you couldn't see it because you weren't watching live, he's great. Every time he finishes playing one of his songs, he kind of does this turn yeah. at the very end, and, like smiles. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> It's a big finish. There you go. I mean, it almost felt like, you yeah. know, and that's where I, yeah. you know, it, it resonates nicely. You can nicely see where the songs come from. Go you can see where the songs come from yeah. and you can see in the movie when every time they act like, what'd you think? <laughs> yeah. You liked it, it right? Yeah. Please say you liked it. <laughs> I think it's like, he's really doing it for, you know, to make people happy and joyous. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it makes that's him exactly. so happy. Exactly. It's wonderful. Yeah. That's the purity there. So, all right, we haven't talked anything about editing. I don't know what else to say about editing other than... I feel like it's we kind of... Because it it, uh, it, gets lo- it gets lost because yeah. it's so My good. only editing thing is the pears. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know how the happy fairy. I was about the flying the on the horse backwards thing. Flying on the horse. Yeah. When Remember? she's riding the white, r- white horse with yeah. Colin Farrell and she's backwards, and we get that shot like four times, so I feel like 
a ton of times throughout the movie. I didn't see her backwards. Did I miss that? I yeah, and the like galloping. It was like a. Uh, oh, oh, I see. When she's in, she's in, she's in, like her she's hair. In, yeah, I see what you're saying. Out, uh, okay. like I very... thought you mentioned when she was alone. I didn't see her. No. No. We're talking about when she was riding on the horse mm-hmm. with him. Okay, with him. Yeah. So you're a little too sentimental, maybe for you. Maybe. All right. Maybe. Yeah. And maybe in my head, I was kind of like. You know, it's, I don't know how pleasant that would be. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 there's a couple times in the film where I was going, oh, nice edit. <laughs> Just uh-huh. because I've done so much of it that I go, that's a good one. I mean, it, it, silly ones. Like when we, uh, we were, I think we're in Disney Studios and they're singing, they're having a fun time or whatever, and then it all falls to pieces. I'm not exactly sure. And we cut right to Australia with the, uh, uh uh, aunt so and so and she's shaking out whatever and that snaps s- snaps us back into mm-hmm. reality of a different time and a different mm-hmm. era but it really clearly cuts us I just thought it was a great little moment don't know why just loved it. out for you Fair yeah just, but there's there like three or four of those where I was like it didn't take me out of the movie like oh I'm, I'm aware of the editing and that's amazing I just went nice that was good. you're like I like that it okay. is it enhanced it for me but uh, you know in terms of the editing um, I think one of the best scenes was the end um only because I, I thought the experience of going on the red carpet yeah. was so well done, and it felt like you know you were kind of going on the ride with her. Right. Okay, but would you have been... I thought the movie was going to end there. I thought the movie was going to end with her linking arms with Mickey and going uh-huh. into the theater. I did not expect to get that next scene. Yeah, I really... I'm glad I didn't either. I wanted but it, it, though, because yeah. I wanted her to find the... It, mm-hmm. I wanted to know how she felt about this thing that she's hated at mm-hmm. the board. And, and it was nice that she... You know, didn't hate it. No, she found solace or whatever. But in real life, well, here's the thing: they say that she didn't like it, and that they also say she's seen it many times, well over ten. I've been, I've researched, and I don't know if that's true, but that's what I've read. I was like, well, if you hate it that much, I'm you're watching it a lot (laughs) with somebody who hates it that much. So I think her public persona is that she hated Mm -hmm. because I'm sure she hated certain things that they did. Yes, but I, I don't think who knows. I don't know how she feels about it. I don't know, but. She's, ha- to say. she's a hard puzzle to solve. But uh, so. but anyway, it doesn't matter because I don't know that w- when she's sitting here in the movie, I don't think what she's hating or liking is the movie so much as I think she's it's a cathartic thing for her to to exper- re-experience that because it's it's bringing up all I that stuff like from the her scene. childhood. I just really didn't expect yeah, it. I, I thought totally great. thought it was going to be over before yeah. it was, and mm-hmm. I'm I was in a way I guess pleasantly surprised. Yeah, it's a little epilogue, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you would you would think that oh here I'm fine. The whole thing's about this thing. Boom, we're, getting, and we walk into the movie starting. And we're done. Da, da, da. Yeah, exactly. So. A little bonus for you. I, 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 th- I thought I Real thought it worked bonus, well. Though. Oh, sorry, Phil. No, well, I, I thought you know, um, it was it was a nice surprise, but I I can't imagine it without it. Yeah. Only because it 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 solidified you know um, her full arc. Yeah, you want to see her at least have some sort of a cathartic moment. You want that for her? At least I did. Go ahead. I didn't say did either or both of you stay through the credits. Yes. No. Phil. Oh, Phil. <laughs> Ah, they played, they what played one of her tapes, they the real tape. Oh, the tape! Yeah, I saw yeah. the tape. Okay. okay, I saw the tape. Yeah, the right, right. because that happened. Was... Here's the thing: I, I'm not a fan of when like the credits start rolling and mm-hmm. then then we cut to something. Mm-hmm. You know, this was right off. This was right off the bat. Yes. So yeah, I, I remember that. Okay, okay. good, good. Right. And I thought that was a fun little yeah. thing they added, and it really cemented kind of to me who she was <laughs> this was yeah. exaggerated because <laughs> to me it. they did make her nicer um, a little bit yeah, you, the, you tape, think about the it. tape was I mean that's I, the thing how do we how you know the p- people that are making that argument how bad was she in real we don't know <laughs> they could have whitewashed her like crazy because <laughs> okay you know uh, part of what I liked you know so in terms of when they start they brought in the way they made her whatever evil or how wh- whatever term you want to use mm-hmm. is through facts right mm-hmm. So how are you going to argue with something like, you know, remember she says interior or exterior of something, something, and this and that. And they're like, well, nobody sees that. That's just the script. Mm -hmm. Well, I see it. But no, no, you don't understand. That's how you write scripts. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. No one sees that. And so, again, but how are you going to argue with this woman who's just so set in her ways Mm -hmm. that how are you going to convince her this is how how people write scripts? (laughs) I see that. (laughs) So, you know what I mean? So yeah. so I thought that was, you know, although very subtle, it's it's a great way to kind of bring that out because now you're just arguing with mm-hmm. irrationality. Yeah. You can't, you you can't argue with crazy. Of, yeah. And if it doesn't affect anything, you just got to let it happen. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Move on. Sure, we'll change it to, what was it? They write out the number or what? Yes, it was like number 17 yeah, number or th- something. Th- number 17, absolutely. <laughs> I thought All that right. was fun. Mm-hmm. Well. All right, what else we got? Anything else? We... 
Uh, we've run our gamut. What else? I what, think what, what got do you want to do favorite a... scenes? Or, or we, I know we, um, t- we always wait till the end. Favorite scenes. I would have to say that I really do love it when her relationship with Ralph and everyone kind yeah. of collapses and you get that she dances yeah. and she's up on her feet and everyone's happy and, she, and this is some Prances and Walt and she's like, she's dancing. <laughs> she's dancing. Because I think everyone felt mm-hmm. that and that they like let you see it. I really loved. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, um, I liked the little moments. I, I would say that to me, it wasn't as much about the pivotal scenes of like the mom walking into the river right. or anything mm-hmm. like that, or even her walking into the theater at the end. Right. To me, I liked the little ones where she's outside in the garden under the tree. That's with, what I was going to point out. Like pointing was, with Ralph. I, it, yeah, it's like, that was just such a fun I, little it, scene. It was. Or, or when she brought Mickey in to mm-hmm. sleep with, into bed because mm-hmm. she like couldn't sleep. Right. The I liked the stage. little moments. And that, more for me, it was, you know, she's really, she is that, that child you mm-hmm. know she's still in, th- in touch with or, or finally becoming mm-hmm. in touch with uh, having a good, and i just love that scene and that yeah great. that's what stuck out to me yeah. and um, that's always fun yeah. it's i not like about the big no, drama it's, it's, it's the just moments like, that build i mm-hmm. liked how she couldn't keep a caretaker yeah <laughs> no, because you know it kind of relates back to mary poppins you know she's always looking for mm-hmm. an exterior well, force yeah, to right. to help her alive and like mm-hmm. she's the worst help yeah. i've ever had but i like the lines but she that kind of reminds me of me yeah <laughs> but she says you're more than capable of doing it which is her line that she's been saying mm-hmm. so that was great yeah uh, really so yeah so that for me was the key moments i think that it was and my favorite line though was when she's talking about the rain and so all of a sudden she's like oh i like the rain and she's in the car with oh, ralph yeah, yeah, and she yeah, like yeah. brings life and ralph goes well the sun brings life yeah. too and she's just like be quiet yeah. or something and i yeah i thought that moment was golden because yeah, it, it was great. so true it was. And but it I, thought, I thought that you know i thought as much of uh, forgiveness was a theme in this movie i also mm-hmm. thought that um not judging people on their first mm-hmm. you know what i mean getting mm-hmm. getting really to know people i mean walt didn't know her yeah. she mm-hmm. didn't know walt mm-hmm. Um, she didn't know the driver. She and didn't they both know. have preconceived ideas about each other. That not only did they not mm-hmm. know each other, they already um, had ideas of who they might be. And, and but both their parallels. I think that the theme of attachment to what is family and how art mm-hmm. becomes your family mm-hmm. and how protective and how much invested. If something's really good, mm-hmm. when people really care about it, and it's particularly in art and film and all, everything like that. When someone's really given, become so much a part of them, mm-hmm. they do anything for it. That's when you get really good material, um, and I, I really appreciated that in this film. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's just Thanks so many so. times, uh, you know. Uh, one of one of the things that I liked was um, Walt's father, right? You know, yeah, as they're lies. taking the tour, mm-hmm. it was it was written there, yeah. and then obviously it ties back to you know your one of your favorite scenes, mm-hmm. or at least. From yeah. what you made it sound like, yeah. you know, uh, when they finally confront each other, mm-hmm. and Walt has that realization of mm-hmm. why she's doing this. Right. Mm-hmm. So, <sighs> in terms of, the, of this movie and all the movies out there these days, are we, are we thinking this should be nominated for Best Picture? I would say yes. I would too, actually. I really like this. There's a couple out that I really, really love. Mm-hmm. Um, and Category kind of Saving Mr. Banks. Um, mm-hmm. I would recommend her for people who haven't seen it. I saw that one recently. Yeah. I would put that up there. I think that. They're both just a little bit different than mm-hmm. your average yeah, story, and mm-hmm. I I think they're fantastic. Um, there's some very good movies this year. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I thought this was strangely inspirational. I don't know what inspires you to do, uh-huh. but but it, it's nice. Uh huh. So it inspired you. Did, did, did I you, don't know to do what. Yeah, but but, but it's a, it found it insp- inspiring. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you have any favorite movies? Is this making your favorite movies of the year yet? Uh, this would absolutely be up there along with Captain Phillips mm-hmm. and uh, a few others. What else? Uh, <laughs> the World's End. I think World's <laughs> End up there. I don't know if I can put that one up Interesting. in there. I'll really be 12 good... Years a Slave up there. Uh, not me. <gasps> I know. I'm not me. Oh, goodness. We're gonna have to, I'm going to have to talk to you about this after. All right. Well, okay. That, All right. That's, 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 that's like we're we're wrapping it up. Off. That's it. All right, well, uh, let everybody know. If they have comments or questions, uh, go to anatomyofamovie.com. Let us know what you're thinking. Um, obviously, there's uh, we could talk a lot about the historical aspects of it, but... Um, we could do a whole thing on Disney. Many people have. You know, again... We covered a lot. I'm sure there's plotting, much more to cover. There's a reason why they call it plotting and in, in, in things, because yeah. it's literally how you navigate the waters of story. Uh, we've plotted our own course here, and so hopefully we dissected uh, enough. 
for you. Okay. But mm-hmm. let us know what you guys want. You know, keep the conversation going. That's yeah. right. Movie anatomy I, I on can't. Twitter. There you go. She doesn't have a Twitter. No. <laughs> Sarah Stratton, everybody. Sarah Stratton. John Thank Comerford. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. We'll, we'll see you, you for the next uh, dissection. Okay. Woohoo. Eye opening. We have an eye. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the rest of the Anatomy of a Movie staff, we would like to thank you for listening and subscribing to the show. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email or tweet us. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been Anatomy of a Movie. Thanks for watching Anatomy of a Movie on YouTube. For more on your favorite movies, subscribe to our channel here, and be sure to let us know what you think in our comment section below here. Bye. Pain, but we didn't really know anything about what was going on until way late in the movie. So it was for mm-hmm. me, it was hard for me to understand her, relate to her. This one, because of this nar- dual narrative going on, I understood her, even though I thought she was a horrible person <laughs> to a large degree. You understood that she was in a hell of a lot of pain and why. So you, I think you could relate exactly. to her better. Exactly. And, you know, in terms of this, again, um, just going off of the idea to make this a perfect thing, the actors really felt it was complete by the time it got to them. The story, you know, you're yeah. talking about the script. The I mean, Colin, the script Fa- Colin yeah. Farrell said, you know, when it came to them, it was nice to get a complete script, yeah. unlike most things that he's yeah. worked on where they're still rewriting it after yeah. he's shot everything. D- yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're rewriting it after. So, you know, to get that, it was a breath of fresh air because they could approach the characters right. uh, knowing what was going to happen. Yeah, with a very full script that had gone through, what, well, at least but 10 years But also you kind of have to, I mean when you're dealing with real people in a real story in the making of you kind of have the story already laid out for you i mean it is a script and there are layers that the writers put in but they're but you have to make here's the thing you know uh what on uh, the director and everyone else compliments kelly on um is that she made the right choices right mm-hmm. stories all about the choices you choose not to include versus right. the choices you yeah. do choose to include mm-hmm. and they felt that she did it very um wisely yeah. throughout mm-hmm. And, I cause it, cause, you know, because they joked about it. I mean, yeah, you know, how many hours could have gone anywhere? Spent, yeah, how yeah. many hours could be spent just in that room? Right. You know, and how boring <laughs> could that actually be? Yeah. Because it could be quite quite boring. And so she made very specific choices mm-hmm. and the way, you know, and the beats. Overall, I thought, you know, in terms of beats, it wasn't a typical story. Mm-hmm. So you felt it was different than usual. So that obviously impressed you and surprised you. Yeah. Yeah. That, and you liked that because I know you hate it when they have the typical stuff, <laughs> which is so weird because it's a Disney movie. You would expect it to have a lot of typical. Well, it had the, it had the typical in terms of messages and mm-hmm. things like that. But then the way it was told, you know, was different. Yeah. Specifically, are you talking about the two narratives, about the character work? Uh, right now, specifically about the narrative. Okay. You know, and I, I thought um, at, at first, you know, uh, when I saw the two different worlds, um, there was a point where I was getting bored of it and I didn't understand. I was like, okay, mm-hmm. this is going on a little bit too long. I, I get it, mm-hmm. but I don't need to be hit over the head. And then when um, when the two worlds collided, literally yeah. at the, uh, the county fair with that song, mm-hmm. A, just great filmmaking in general, but it literally symbolized, you know, These collision kind of, of her worlds. Exactly. And so she chose the right moment, you know, mm-hmm. I... I Again, I, I give a lot of effort, a lot of credit to that because it was the perfect moment to do it. Mm-hmm. So her past coming in to collide with the future yeah. or her present. Mm-hmm. But I, I, you know, I, a lot of not a lot, but a few uh, critics I've I've read have talked about how they didn't like the structure of this, and I and I I, I don't I don't I can't understand that. I didn't I didn't have any problems with the structure of this. I was just like, wow, well, it's an easy thing to follow. I don't know why I don't know why anybody would have issues with it. But did you guys uh, were you uh, at all thrown by it? The dual narrative or the way that they... I wasn't thrown by the dual narrative or by, like, the actions going on. I mm-hmm. think that one thing that did was given to a, a way to... Tons of research. I don't know how many pages of notes you have over there, so oh I'm gosh. anxious to hear what you had to say. Um, well, we, ha- we have a very close friend named Andrew Lee yes. who um, who owns uh, J- uh, Lee Apparel, mm-hmm. and they license out to Disney and things like that, and he's a huge fan of Walt Disney, and I wanted him to be part of the panel. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, he could not. No, no, so I, I had to guy. do him a great service by doing a lot yeah, of re- so, extra okay, research. Because just, you know he's going to be listening, and he'll be making sure that you get this stuff right. Okay, so all the Disney trivia, yeah. all of those are we're going to pass to Phil. Oh, absolutely. So he he's going to verify right. everything. <laughs> I'm the historian here today. All the people who know everything right. about Disney, you all can right. judge. So Phil. let's start off by how this thing came, became a movie. We're going to talk specifically about the actual, uh, well, the, the road to it becoming a movie. Rather than getting into the history or the story of it, let's just talk about how it became a movie. Because I think, if I'm correct, uh, it's Ian Colley that started this with a, 
uh, basically a documentary of P.L. Travers and her history and all that kind of stuff in Australia. And then from that, he realized there might be a picture involved or a film, a, bio, a biopic or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he hired or he brought in Sue, if I'm not mistaken, yes. to help write this. And it was brought in outside of Disney, Absolutely. completely yeah. written separately. Yeah. And then from there, it's obviously very famously been blacklisted. Mm -hmm. And and for those who don't know the blacklist, if, if you, wanna you want to elaborate on that. Sure, elaborate blacklist. on that because a lot of people may not know that. So basically, the blacklist is a, a bunch of screenplays yes. that are voted on for being fantastic mm -hmm. but no one makes them yeah they're, they're supposedly the 10 best movies floating around hollywood that haven't been made exactly and every year they come out with this blacklist and everyone else is wondering why aren't these being made yes, oh my God, um, it's amazing it's this amazing. one to me i completely understand why it was mm -hmm. on that list there's a lot of hurdles involved with this screenplay one of which what i don't know disney home. <laughs> no, protective brand that yeah. owns the world yeah that could be part of it <laughs> which um, is very uh oh, close to the vest on what they want to uh, yeah. allow people to use in terms of licensing go ahead and so she was very accurate i mean sue made a point to say that if disney hadn't picked up picked it up no one ever for good yeah i don't know how you could get of it licensing yeah. and the, just the arrangements and all the legal stuff behind this. And that, I found that interesting, too, because they even wrote the script knowing that we're writing into the script the uh, the ability to use some of these songs and we have no idea whether or not we're ever going to get them or have the rights to use them, but that we're going to use them as our motivating factors for our actors. It's and, just one of those things that proves yeah. sometimes if you don't put yeah. all of those restrictions about yeah. what's possible and what's impossible mm -hmm. in the creation of a film or whatever... Mm -hmm. Then it turns out great because, like, you have to push through and you have yeah. to find those things, but you're not putting those limitations on yourself before you create right. it. You let yourself create it. You let yeah. yourself have this world. Write the best and thing you can you and worry about the rest of it later. Well, I think exactly. you know, for for Kelly when she got involved, for her it was all it was going to be about forgiveness. It wasn't going to necessarily yeah. be about the negotiation part of it. Right. And so when you come into it from that perspective, you do want to write the best yeah. screenplay possible. And I, you know, that's where it stems from. It's like, okay, well, you know, if we're gonna do this, I have to use the music, and that, right. that's what she said. There was, you know, there was yeah. a choice in my mind. I had to, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because it had, the, the music had nothing to do with the, the it, well, P.L. Travers, because obviously the music mm -hmm. had been written, it had nothing to do with her history or why those those characters became what they became. But I, I just love that they found a way to use them and 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 uh, help support the story that they wanted to tell. I completely agree. Also, I, the music along with some of their. To me, their shot choices uh -huh. really brought you back into that world of Mary Poppins and the one I remembered. Right. Um, so every time a song came up, it did remind me that they were making this in this effort to make a joyous film mm -hmm. and a film that really did last with, I think it grossed over a hundred million throughout the years. It's like a hundred and two million. And so mm -hmm. this Mary Poppins impacted a lot of people. And every time one of the songs would come up, I was kind of reminded of that. Also, yeah. when they had like the shots, there was of picking up the carpet bags and of yeah. her feet and that reflection and those parallels they yeah. brought from the original film, I really like. Well, just even, you know, we opened up with a spoonful of sugar. Yeah. And, you know, in the movie, there's that line this is going to be a very iconic song. People will be singing it for weeks to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to open up with that because, yeah. you know, I asked the people that I was with and I was like, is that your favorite song? Is that what you sang? Yeah. It yeah. was. Yeah. And, you know, to, to have that foresight then and obviously to bring that into the script. We'll talk about all the golden nuggets. You didn't also like how that was like a, she used that line before they wrote the song? I did. She, yeah, how mm -hmm. she asked for a spoonful of sugar in her tea? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, yes, draw indeed. notice to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else was I going to say? Um, y you know, in terms of the... They, uh, this is Emma Thompson said it about it, about how she kind of approached the character, but it does go back to the script, how there's no clear arc for the character, and in times, she tends to be inconsistent yeah. with, with the way she is. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I like that because, again, it is, um, it's a little bit different from most Yeah, movies. I usually have a clear arc and everything there, but, you know, I, 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 I didn't agree with that so much because, I, I, for me, there did seem, to, for me, there was a clear arc. I understand that she was inconsistent, but people are inconsistent. They're not always, you know, mm -hmm. it's one of the things that confounds us about being human. Mm -hmm. But what I liked about that is what you liked about it, it was different. And but I could see because she was on this, the whole thing was confusing and con and confounding to her uh, in sense of uh, she's in this play. And I know we're not going to talk story, but the character itself, because of where she is in her life, she is being battled, batted about a little bit by life of, of where she is. So that's why I thought that inconsistency made sense. Yeah. And even though uh, the the final thing was about forgiveness. 
she couldn't get to any of that forgiveness until all this stuff had she had gone through all this other stuff and i think that one of the reasons the inconsistency worked so well mm -hmm. and we were able to like her through it was because they did have the dual narratives going yeah and because they brought back the flashbacks that were giving mm -hmm. you insights as to why she was acting Be that way because she's so prickly <laughs> exactly that made you it right. made her more endearing it made you see her creative side mm -hmm. and that she did have this imagination and this love and this potential so the inconsistency that Emma Thompson was playing, mm -hmm. I felt I was more inclined to like accept and enjoy it, because I was getting the reason why right. she was like and, that simultaneously. And if I can, I want to point to, when we talked about gravity, uh, one of the points I was making about that particular character, the lead in that, uh, she was obviously in pain. Me beforehand mm -hmm. was that her father was struggling with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that going straight into that world okay. um, before he pulled out the bottle, before she, before the mother mm -hmm. found it in his jacket, any of that, I already kind of knew mm -hmm. that. Um, without that, I think I might have been confused oh, okay. for a little bit. Um, but as I said, I thought it really supported mm -hmm. Emma Thompson's character and I liked that they needed it. It was also interesting to me that it was very visually different. Mm -hmm. Like color-wise, it had much more of a dreamy effect where yeah. everything does seem childlike and mm -hmm. happy and it's this fantasy world. But I thought that that's still connected to Disney. And mm -hmm. to me, the film as a whole worked with the two narratives, with the styling. And although they were different and definitely clashing, it didn't, it didn't bother yeah, me. Yeah, I didn't understand that cri critique at all because I, I, I didn't understand how anybody could be confused by it. <laughs> I mean, it may, was the worry that it's for a PG-13 audience and uh -huh. so they might not get, I don't know. Uh, yeah, anyway, it, I can't. I just, I'm glad that you guys didn't. I mean, do you think this was really targeted to people though that were under thirteen? I think that it, I mean they made very just in terms no. of Tom Hanks alone with with I mean this this ties back to Walt Disney himself where uh, he thought his public image would go down with his mm. you know if he showed himself actually smoking yeah if he ever and was. in order to be a PG thirteen movie they could show him um, finishing mm -hmm. his the cigarette, cigarette but, but never and he had to fight for that yeah. Tom yeah. Hanks personally had to fight for that well Disney wouldn't sign on that's the only mm -hmm. that was they had like two a couple qualifications that was one of the qualifications you can never show him smoking not mm -hmm. inhaling you couldn't mm -hmm. show him inhaling that doesn't mean you couldn't have the cigarette. but 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 the point of that is that uh, obviously they wanted to get the PG thirteen yeah. rating why why in the world with this Saving Mr. Banks being an R-rated movie just right. because it's, you know what yeah, I mean? I so, yeah. so they want to go for that younger crowd. Well, yeah, but it's the, a family I, movie. It yeah. came out during the holiday. It, well, yeah, clearly, yeah. But, but I guess I would, I guess I personally don't picture this as like a children's family movie. I do picture this as, I would say I'm like on the younger end of the audience. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what I've read is that there there have been a lot of parents taking their kids to it, 10, 11 year olds. Yeah, absolutely. Not kidding you. They they all they've all have asked like, is it appropriate? Cuz they think it's about Mary Poppins in some way, but you know, it's not a Mary Poppins movie and, and I don't think it's made for kids at all. I think it's an adult movie. I do. I, but I, I don't, you know, it's, but I don't, it's obviously I don't think not it, an R movie. Yeah, but so, what prevents it from kids Only being because able to, I I think they would it. get bored with the fact especially the uh, Australia stuff is like, you know, that what what you know, there's kind of I'm fun not, but there there are adult themes and I mean know, for kids it, it, it's it's one of the the great conundrums of this movie. Do you see you know? Do you see Mary Poppins before you see this movie? Do you yeah, see it after? If, exactly. And especially no, if you've I never didn't. seen it, right. then you're yeah. like, you that's any the kind big of choice. That's what I mean. If you don't know Mary Poppins, does this movie hold up for you? Because a lot. Of, I mean, let's face it. The music is in the whole thing's about Mary Poppins. Yeah, but the, kind of but even even from the script level, they would you know we'll talk about the golden nuggets that they inserted throughout the whole movie. Yeah. But they were very conscious to to be like, okay, it needs to be a standalone movie. If yes. someone saw this yeah. for the first time, it would have to make sense. And the, and for people who know Mary Poppins, yeah. it would make a lot more sense and be, again, it's golden nuggets. Yeah, but you just get a different layer. You get an... I'm opening. We have an eye, sort of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. <laughs> That's how, how appropriate that we start off with that. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Anatomy of a Movie. I'm John Comerford. I'm joined on the big panel by Sarah Stratton. Hello, everybody. Phil Svitek. Hello, hello. And helming the booth is Stephen Lemieux. Thank you very much for helping us out, Stephen. Hey, guys. So, uh, Saving Mr. Banks, 
Was it, uh, did you find it chimchimmery or did, was this a medicine too hard to swallow even with a spoonful of sugar? I mean, I wouldn't say it's the most chippest movie in the world, but I <laughs> did really enjoy it. I thought that they had a good balance of fun and character development and I was very intrigued by the stories and the characters and I really liked it and mm. liked everyone involved. So I'm all in for this movie. I cool. thought, I thought uh, it was, I thought it was a perfect movie. You know, in, in the sense of... Perfect. I, wow. I th- in the in the way they told it, I thought that you know you, you definitely knew that you were watching a movie, but it was beautifully shot, it mm-hmm. was beautifully told, and things like that. And this, mm-hmm. is the, I believe, this is the first movie that we're going to talk about. That's the making of a movie. Yeah. So we're going to be di- dissecting the dissection of a movie, movie which is going to be very interesting. meta. I mean, it's very still meta. screenplay. It's still actors. Yeah. It's still yeah. All of that. Well, I think it f- certainly delivered on what it promised. It does. It. I mean, you're getting exactly what you think you would get out of it. I mean, it's it's funny. It's you, you certainly get the tears, and uh, you know, and then actually you get even a little bit more because I had no idea it was going to have some sort of that that the depth that it did. I do. I wasn't. I knew what the story was about, and I grew up with Mary Poppins as uh-huh. the Disney film. Um, and this film obviously gave me kind of a different interpretation of that movie, mm-hmm. and. It added its own different themes about family, yeah. about you know alcoholism, about all these other layers, mm-hmm. um, which I really enjoyed because it it wasn't just the making of, it wasn't just an explanation of why they made it. It really dealt into people's lives, but also gave you a larger picture scope. So I liked it. In that yes, sense. because uh, just the fact that something that is a great childhood memory of mine or and, and of many, Mary Poppins, and you realize that that came out of a hell of a lot of pain for somebody else. <laughs> I thought our childhood memories, which are great, are coming off the pain mm-hmm. of somebody else. How wonderful. And the relationship that this movie has with artists and how they create yeah. and the relationship between characters and their development. And mm-hmm. I believe there was one line that um, one of Tom Hanks' lines was about how not only are they family but it's a release. It's a release yeah. for them to fix the world and these characters they create. And I, I just thought that was beautiful yeah. and a beautiful message. Well, we have lots to talk about. Phil, you've done 